Okay, uh, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to join us. Uh, today it's the uh, option section for the UFS middle range weather app training and this section is designed for provide more information for the developers. Uh, today, actually, uh, we have uh, three talks and one discussion session. Before we start, I have uh, uh, three uh, logistic uh, uh, informations. One is actually uh, Jimmy already uh, put all recorded presentations on our agenda, which is a password protected agenda we use for this meeting. And right now, actually, Wednesday and Thursday meetings are all there. Uh, the presentations are all there and uh, Jimmy is working on Friday's one. And uh, please feel free to check that out. I believe this uh, agenda and the record uh, re recorded presenting will be there for a while and uh, maybe for there for many, many years. Uh, the second is actually, we do hope actually we got as much as feedback we can or we really hope you can give us some feedback. Uh, we have a Slack channel called Feedback, just like presentation and uh, practice. Uh, but uh, we, I just found out you, you, you have to basically uh, join that channel by actually, I have some very brief information uh, in general channel, how to join the feedback channel. You have to review all the channels and pick that feedback channel to join. Uh, you are very welcome to give us any feedback, good, bad, or what you, what's missing and it will be very uh, important information for us to make uh, future training better. Uh, the third is also related to the Slack channel. Please feel free to send your questions to through the Slack channel. Uh, we are going to have a discussion session this afternoon and the Mac will uh, make a, a all these questions available through that discussion and uh, should be answered by uh, uh, subject uh, matter experts this afternoon. So please keep putting your questions on Slack channel, not only for today, but uh, if last week or any other questions related to UFS uh, system, please uh, feel free to put that, uh, that question in Slack channel. Okay, but for now, let's start uh, with Mike uh, Kovilic. Uh, I'm sorry about that. and. Yeah, his topic is code management and making contributions to the UFS. Seems Mike is ready. Please uh, go ahead. All right, thanks, Ming. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Kavulich, um, and I work in uh, DTC um, at NCAR. <clears throat> and uh, I'll be talking about uh, code management and making contributions to the UFS. Um, so just a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is, uh, is version control um, and specifically Git and GitHub um, and, and the version control used by UFS. Um, so the first half of the talk is going to kind of be an overview of that. Um, so apologies to people who are already familiar with Git, Git and GitHub. That's going to mainly just be uh, stuff you already know kind of thing. Um, next, I'll talk about the UFS structure, um, including submodules and manage, manage externals, how the UFS is arranged. And also, uh, finally, talk about making and contributing changes to the UFS code. So the first thing uh, we need to establish is, well, what is version control? So in the olden days, code development, whether it was for an individual or in a team setting, uh, was a slow, divergent process with lots of potential for problems. Um, these included keeping track of the original version of the official version of the code, uh, relied on outside communication and or naming conventions. Um, there was difficulty in remembering what, what changes were made and when and by whom. Uh, Working on multiple changes simultaneously could result in frustrating conflicts and overlapping changes, and figuring out when and how a bug was introduced could be near impossible. Um, it was decided a better system was needed, and so version control software was developed to enable users to keep the authoritative version of the code in a central location that everyone can see. Um, you can track changes to the code, uh, allow multiple individuals or groups to make changes to the code independently, and recognize and resolve when conflicting changes are made to the code. So just a quick overview of what version control is and how it works. So version control software simply tracks the history of changes to files. 
Um, in other words, it keeps tracks of different versions of a file or files as they are modified over time. Um, there are three main different types of uh, version control, one of which uh, probably everybody's going to be familiar with, which is linear version control. It's simple, but, ubi but it's ubiquitous. Um, one example is Microsoft Word. When you're making changes in Microsoft Word, you can undo and redo these changes um, because Word is basically keeping version control of your changes to the document as you, as you make them. Um, there's uh, the so-called centralized version control, which we're not really going to talk about, but I figured I'd mention it because Subversion is actually a different uh, version control software that many people may have used before. Um, and this is kind of being phased out in favor of Git in the, in the UFS context and also in the software community in general. And uh, so in this context, what we're tracking simply is plain text files. So this is like source code, run scripts, documentation. Um, in most of my slides, I'm going to refer to when I'm referring to code, um, what I'm actually referring to is these text files. So the source code, they could be run scripts, documentation, readme files, etc. cetera. Um, what we're not tracking is things like uh, binary files, executables, data, uh, video files, images, um, anything that's not kind of a simple text file. So these things can be tracked, but in, in general, it's not a good idea. And it's definitely not a good idea to be committing these files to, the, to your code repositories. So the version control software that's used for the, the, I think the entirety of the UFS project now is Git. So Git version control is, it's a software that was developed by, the, by and for the Linux project. Um, it's decentralized. So rather than a single central copy of a code repository where all changes must be handled, everyone has an equally valid copy of the entire code repository. Now this sounds complicated and it can be, uh, but the standard workflow that is used by most of the UFS components is a way to keep everything organized. Among the many advantages to the systems are that it's simple to track local development on your local machine, even for minor changes. Um, internet access is not needed for active development until it's time to move these changes elsewhere. And inadvertent changes can be usually undone very easily. And Git is mainly used, it's, it's by far the most dominant version control system in the software community. Um, it's, this isn't just a, a scientific thing. It's used throughout the software community. So it has a lot of support, which is another good thing about it. Um, in 2018, almost 90% of surveyed software engineers said they, re, they preferred it as their version control software. So if, the, if you're having trouble with Git, odds are somebody has already asked and answered that question. Um, so how Git works is it's a self-contained bunch of tracked code is basically the the code repository. So I've mentioned repository a few times. And if you don't know what that is, basically any uh, self-contained like, bunch of tracked code or text files is known as a repository. So a Git repository can be created from scratch, um, but we'll focus on existing code since that's what we're using through the UFS. You really shouldn't be creating your own new repository unless you're way too advanced for this tutorial. Um, you have already used Git at least once, uh, which is when you began the practical session. So you saw this command before, git clone. Um, so git clone creates a clone or a local copy of an existing repository. And we did git clone with this URL after it. And that URL is simply the location of the medium range weather app repository on GitHub. Um, we checked out, we used this dash B flag to check out the branch that was named uh, UFS v1.1.0. Um, I just realized it's actually misleading because it's actually a tag, not a branch, but I'll get into the, the details about that in a later slide. And finally, the, the last thing that we entered was just uh, this the name of a directory. So it's the directory where the local clone of the repository will be created. And you can, can, you can try any of the commands in this presentation uh, at home if you'd like, um, assuming your machine supports Git and most uh, Unix and Linux based machines do. Um, since Git clone gives you a full copy of the repository, you can really do whatever you like with it. Okay, so the way that Git tracks these changes is it basically uh, creates these save points. So a Git save point is known as a commit. And each commit contains a change to the code that's being tracked by Git 
a commit message, which is a uh, basically just a message that's provided by the person who made the changes, and a SHA-1 hash that uniquely identifies that commit as well as all commits that came before it. Um, that part's kind of complicated. You don't really need to know about it, but there's a lot written about it on the internet if you're uh, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, the git log command gives a list of all commits since the repository was created. So if you type git log, you'll see something like this uh, screenshot here where you see uh, a commit with a, a long hash. Um, you see the author, the date, and a message that was included by the, by the author of that commit. So you can create a commit by modifying code, first of all, um, in a, whatever text editor is your favorite. Um, you stage that code, um, and I'll get into what that means later, and then you uh, commit your code. Um, so there's a, a command called git status. Um, after you've made these changes to your code, uh, that will show the files that are different from what git has in its ledger. So git notices when something has been changed. Um, <clears throat> in this example, uh, I've, I've changed two files. Um, oh, I never practiced uh, trying the mouse pointer. Can you all, can you all see my mouse? Let's try this. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Um, so you can see here that uh, Git has kind of uh, has noticed that there's been changes made to the code. So I modified two different files, and I also created a new file. And so there's. A, a lot of different information that uh, Git will give here when you do Git status. So there's a, the first line here that says you're on branch develop. That shows what branch you're on. And again, we'll get into that. Um, and Git has recognized that there are some file changes here. It has also noticed that there's an untracked file that it does not know about. So after you've made these changes, maybe you don't remember exactly what you changed. So you can use the git diff command. And this basically just shows you the difference between what Git has in its, its own ledger and what is now currently on your file system. So it notices the differences that you have made to the changes that you have made to the code. So you can see at the top here, there's a, a new file. Um, you've made some changes to this build script and this other uh, configure script. And so git diff will show you what's been changed there. And so now we've modified the code. We've looked at what those modifications are. Now it's time to stage that code for commit. Now what staging means is basically you're telling Git, you may have made the changes and Git has noticed that there's changes, but you need to tell explicitly tell Git exactly what changes you want Git to remember. And so if you've made a change, and in this example, I've uh, told Git that I want to add all of the files. So all three of these files, um, I have used git add build.sh and these other two files. And then if I do a git status, you can see that git notices that these changes are ready to be committed. So there's a new file and there's a couple of files modified. And uh, you basically do this by using the git add command. And git add uh, can be used on individual files. Um, so if you've modified a file, if you've modified two different files, but you only want to commit one of those changes to memory, um, you would do git add file one and git will just ignore the other file because you haven't told git that you want to commit that. Um, you can use git add on full directories or even use wildcards, but this is strongly discouraged um, basically because it makes it very easy to accidentally commit files you don't want to commit, um, which can cause unintended consequences further down the line, especially for if you accidentally commit large files such as source code and things like and executables and things like that that shouldn't be tracked. And finally, once you've modified your code and staged the code, you can then commit the code. So the command git commit will commit <clears throat> the changes that you have told commit you have told git that you want to track using git add. And this will bring up a text editor for you to enter your commit message. Now a commit message for your own fork, and we'll get into what that means. But when you're making changes locally, um, your commit message can be as brief or as detailed as you like, but it should be enough to give you a, to give you an idea of what was changed and why. OK, so I mentioned Git branches a few times. Um, the simplest repository uh, will consist of a single linear history all the way back to its creation. So you just have the beginning of, of all time where you created this 
this new file and you've been making new files and new changes over time for many years um, until present day. Um, but that's not really how code development really works. Um, it's useful to have the ability to work on multiple changes to a repository in parallel. So Git allows and it really encourages uh, a branch functionality. So branching allows for parallel development of different capabilities or fixes in the code at the same time uh, that don't have to overlap with each other. Um, it can be used to separate code undergoing active development from that that is being tested for release or being kept stable for some other purpose. Um, as I mentioned, if you never change anything and you're just making commits, all commits will go on the main branch of a repository by default. Um, most UFS components, the name of this branch is develop. For others, it may be master or main. Um, the name of the branch typically doesn't matter. It's just for human readability or conventions. For the medium range weather app release that we've been using this week, actually all this code is coming from branches that are named release slash public dash V number number, um, depending on the release number of that component. Since uh, basically all the UFS uh, components are in, are in different repositories and I'll kind of get to how that structure works in a, in a later slide. Um, we, uh, these different releases have different numbers basically. Um, and you in order to check out a new branch um, that is identical to your current branch, you would use this git checkout command. Um, and it's good practice to always create a new branch when making changes to the code that you know you'll need to keep, or even if you suspect you may need to keep them. Um, it's really good practice to, to always create a new branch if you think you'll be committing anything. Um, so this is this will give you an idea of uh, kind of what that looks like. The details aren't too important, but I kind of wanted to exp at least have a visual example of what Git branching looks like. So this is the example that we used earlier um, that is basically just, you have your main branch, in this case it's master, and you make a commit, and then from there you make another commit, and from there you make another commit, and it's a linear history. Um, but in a uh, more complicated uh, branching structure, um, a commit here um, will then be, you create a new branch, um, so then that same commit goes down here, and a bunch of different commits may happen over here, um, someone may take a branch of your branch and make some commits and then merge them back in. Again, the specifics aren't important right now, but I just kind of wanted to show you how branching allows kind of independent work that can uh, be sort of interoperable, even though it's the kind of the same um, kind of the same code uh, that's kind of branching out and merging together in different ways. Um, and I thought I heard a Slack message, but I can't actually see them. Uh, so I'll I'll either get to those at the end, or if it's if it's uh, more urgent, um, uh, Ming or somebody can read it out. Um, so Git tags, as I mentioned earlier, each Git commit has this unique forty character hash that identifies it. Um, it's unique, but it's not very memorable. Um, so Git tags basically allow a hash, which is a uh, frozen permanent snapshot of the code, basically. They allow that hash to be referenced in a human readable way. Um, and Git tags are typically created by repository managers for important events. Um, for example, an official code release, uh, which is the, the tag v1.1.0 of the uh, medium range weather app is the one that we've been checking out and using for uh, the practice sessions that we've had this week. Um, other examples of tags can be for a stable, well-tested version of the code that's produced by developers, or a reference to a specific event in the repository history that needs to be preserved for some reason. Now, uh, I promise this isn't a paid advertisement for Git, but uh, I can't uh, emphasize enough how useful it can be in your in your day-to-day -day life, even outside of the UFS. Um, and uh, trust me, I wish somebody had told me to start using version control when I was in grad school, because I was in the boat of just basically naming files, num version one, version two, version three, and that just gets cumbersome and, and problematic very quickly. Um, way too much material to cover. This, is, this could be an entire, uh, an entire college course on how to use Git properly and fully, um, but I just included some examples of different things you can do with Git here. 
Um, and for more information, I included I included a link here. Again, all these all these uh, presentations are going to be available um, online later for you to look at. And uh, I would recommend looking at the official documentation if if you're kind of want to get a, an idea of how it all works because it is quite accessible in my opinion. So we talked about Git. Uh, what we haven't talked about is GitHub, which we also have probably been, uh, we, which we also have been mentioning many times in the past week. <clears throat> so GitHub uh, is actually a website, and it's specifically for hosting and maintaining Git repositories. So GitHub allows for many additional capabilities on top of the built-in Git functionality. Git being kind of just a command line utility. GitHub is an entire website with a so user interface that's very user friendly, and it includes a lot of additional functionality such as uh, forks, pull requests, issue tracking, and I'm going to get into these in subsequent slides. So this is an example of what GitHub looks like if you haven't visited already. You can see, uh, you may have noticed earlier when we did Git clone in the practice sessions, um, it was, you were feeding it a, a website, a URL. And that, if you go to that URL, it'll show you something like this. So you can see here, we have the medium range weather app um, under the UFS community organization. And what, oh, I'm sorry. So what you see here is basically a, a rundown of some of the useful functionality that's there. Um, so there's a, a few different branches. Actually, there's only two branches in, uh, in this particular repository, but there may, be, there may be many for different components. Um, and you can choose those from a drop-down menu. Um, kind of in the, in the center of the page, there's a browsable directory structure of the code repository. So you can actually click on each of these files and directories and see the full text of each file. You can even see the, the history of changes to that file and who made them and what pull requests they were associated with. Um, you can browse the entire history of the entire repository by clicking up here. And you can also see over here what the latest release tag is. Um, in this case, it's UFS v1.1.0, which is the one we've been using for this, uh, the UFS training in the past week. So GitHub allows, uh, one of the additional functionalities GitHub allows is the, uh, the idea of forking. So Git allows individuals to keep their own copy of the authoritative repository. Um, and this is known as a fork. Uh, a fork, like every other Git repository, is a full standalone repository containing the entire commit history, uh, all branches and tags. The fork is stored under your own GitHub account, and you have full permissions to make as many changes as you want without affecting the authoritative repository. Um, so this, I'll go over this again in a specific example towards the end of my talk, um, but creating a new fork is very simple. Um, you go to whatever repository you're interested in uh, playing around with. Um, in this case, it's the medium range weather app repository. And you go to the top right and there's a button that says fork. Um, if you, you may get a dialogue that says something like this, but you'd wanna choose uh, your own username. So in my case, it's mkvulic. Um, and uh, that's where you would fork the repository to. And once you click on that, it will take a few seconds, but it's, it's almost instantaneous. And now you have a fork, your own personal copy of this repository. Um, and the only difference is instead of saying UFS community here, it says mkvulic, which is my username. Um, and if you're looking at a fork, the basically the only difference is gonna be that it'll say up in the top left that this was forked from and then list the official repository. Everything else, including where you'd look at branches, where you'd look at the code, that all looks exactly the same. So why I'm mentioning this, um, not just for convenience, it, it is a convenient feature, but we definitely want to emphasize that all development and new contributions should come from a user's fork. And once your fork is created, in order to work from the work with the code and make changes to the code, instead of cloning the official repository, um, in this case, UFS community uh, organization, you would clone uh, the fork, which is the entire, the entire URL is the same, except instead of UFS community, it'll be your GitHub username. And again, aside from having a different URL, working in a clone of your fork is essentially the same as working in a clone of the main repository. So 
Git, another functionality that GitHub allows um, is an issue tracker. So the GitHub issue tracker is basically a tool of, for communication with other collaborators on a given repository. And issues are simply numbered messages associated with this repository, essentially. Um, and they can be used however you want, but usually they're used for keeping track of changes that need to be made or will be made to the code. And reasons for opening an issue uh, include pointing out a bug in the code or requesting a feature or announcing or kind of announcing that you're about to make a change to the code. Um, typically, issues will consist of a title briefly describing the issue, followed by more detailed text. And issues can be closed or resolved by pull requests, which I'll get into uh, in a second. So this is just an example of what an issue page looks like. In this case, it's the UFS weather model. Um, you go to this URL, or you can click the uh, issues tab above a repository, and you will kind of see a list of issues. So here, this is uh, basically just what it looks like. Um, you can see kind of a title, uh, who it was opened by, how long it's been open. Um, and when you kind of click on one of those issues, you'd see more detailed text. So in this case, it was um, kind of documenting a bug fix that's about to go into the code. Um, it's uh, mentioning the reasons, and uh, there's some there's a, a label that was added to it to kind of keep track of which issues are for what, and then there was some conversation after that um, involving uh, what exactly should be changed and maybe some suggestions for how the change should be made. So dialing back for a second uh, to Git instead of GitHub, um, there's a bit of Git we haven't covered yet, and that's Git push and Git pull. So when commits are made, um, as we mentioned, repositories are kind of these self-contained blobs of code that you, when you clone a repository, you have the entire repository. And it's standalone and it can function just as any other repository. So if you make code changes um, on the command line, on whatever machine you're doing testing on or development on, um, you have committed those changes to your local copy of the repository, but that's the only location there that they exist. So in order to get those code changes back to the main repository on GitHub or your fork, you need to push those commits back to the origin using the git push command. Now kind of in the opposite direction, uh, because these repositories are self-contained, um, when commits are made to, by others to the main repository, they do not automatically populate in your local clone. So if somebody has added a bug fix in the main repository and you're working happily away on what uh, your new development or scientific change, uh, that change will not automatically be placed in your repository. Well, you need to pull that change in. And that is, you, that is done by using the git pull command. And leading into the next slide, uh, GitHub pull requests. So I mentioned git pull. Um, if you like, would like to make a change to a repository, whether that be for a new feature, a bug fix, um, or any sort of scientific change, you can do so via what's called a pull request. A pull request uh, is often abbreviated PR. Um, it's basically a request to have your changes pulled into the official repository from your fork. Uh, a PR can be applied between any two branches in any repositories with a common history, but traditionally, and in the UFS workflow, they are applied from a fork to the main repository. So in opening a pull request, it's generally expected that you will provide a description of the changes, justification for those changes, and a summary of the different tests that are conducted. And different projects will have different requirements, and I'll get to that in later slides. Um, so this is just a, a quick idea of how you would go about opening a pull request. So if you've just made a push, uh, if you've made some code development and have uh, on, on your local fork and you hit git push. If you then go back to the web interface, it will actually give you a nice box that says, hey, we noticed we you made some changes and pushed them to GitHub. Um, maybe you wanna open a new pull request and that'll give you a handy button there. Um, but if it's an older change and you haven't made any changes recently, but you still wanna open a pull request, um, this button on the top right of the repository uh, code is always gonna always gonna be there for you to open a new pull request. <clears throat> so that was a lot of uh, 
a lot of technical details and an avalanche of information. Um, and again, this is kind of a, the, a subject that really needs an entire college course to cover for thoroughly. Um, but uh, I, I guess maybe I should uh, stop for questions now if there were any specific questions about Git and GitHub. Um, I actually can't see the Slack window because I'm in full screen. Uh, we didn't see, Mike, we didn't see the question from Slack or, okay. from, the, yeah. fr or from the chat. So uh, anyone has a question, yeah, please feel free to speak up at this moment. <laughs> okay. I, I heard the Slack message, but it may have been uh, another workspace uh, that was uh, working on something else. Yeah. Um, so if, if there are no other, no questions yet, I'll, I'll move on then. Oh, Mike, can you hear me? This is oh, yes. Evans. Hi. Oh, hi. So yeah, I asked a question in Slack that um, I, I can make a little bit more general than my specific question. So if we uh, um, like make local modifications, we know are always going to remain local. Um, so uh, in my case, to be very specific about it, um, I always modify the wharf code so that I can do like incremental boundary conditions. But it's never something that I want to add to the main repository um, because I know that there's a small occasional bug in it. But every time there's a, an official release, I have to modify the code locally um, when I do that. Is that something that you think I should ever do in Git? I've never used Git for it. Um, just sort of looking for your expertise on that if you think it's uh, I would definitely recommend trying it out because as I mentioned, even for local changes, um, Git is a really good way of, of kind of keeping track of what changes have been made and when. And in addition, especially because WORF is contained in a Git repository, um, you can actually uh, basically just take your changes and I, I kind of skipped over this on one slide, but there's, there's different functionalities such as Git merge and Git cherry pick that will allow you to take changes from one branch and apply those same changes to a different branch. Um, and so if you kind of have your changes from release, say we're 4.0 and then we're 4.1 comes along, um, you can kind of take those changes and sort of plop them on top of the, the new release that's been provided. Um, so I would definitely recommend doing that. Um, it's, it's definitely, like I keep saying, it's definitely not something that comes easily because it is a very powerful system, um, which requires a lot of information to take full advantage of it. Um, but certainly, um, uh, I would I would recommend at least giving it a shot. Okay, and that was Git merge and Git uh, cherry pick. Those are the things I should look into a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Okay, um, and uh, I've already used more time than I intended, so I guess I'll move on to the, the stuff that's more specific to UFS um, before we run out of time here. So um, the UFS structure, um, you've seen that you've probably seen a similar diagram to this a few times, but uh, the UFS is composed of a number of individual standalone code bases, um, most of which were initially independent components. Um, each of these components is in its own separate repository. And I'll just point out a few of them here, but obviously all of these are important. Um, there's the UFS weather model, um, which is the main repository for the weather model and its components. Uh, there's the FV3 uh, ATM, which contains the atmospheric component of the weather model. Um, the CCPP physics, which contains the GFS physics scheme. Uh, the Atmos Cube Sphere repository, which contains the FV3 dynamical core. So how exactly are all these repositories linked together? Surely it's a nightmare to keep track of all these changes going into every repository. Some of these repositories are independent. Um, so we, we actually use two different systems to keep these repositories linked together. Um, it's handled through uh, a tool called Manage Externals and a functionality of Git called Submodules. So Submodules are a native functionality of Git. Um, which basically allows a repository to be linked as a subdirectory of another repository. And uh, Manage Externals is a similar tool, um, but it was actually developed, uh, developed in uh, UCAR, I believe, um, by the ES, ESMCI group. Um, and it's related to SIEM. 
uh, the scene project. And it basically adds some additional functionality on top of submodules. And the external repositories that are being tracked kind of in, kind of in the top level UFS app um, are tracked in this top level text file that's called externals.cfg. And on the right, you can see an example of what that looks like. It basically just has a, uh, a stanza for each repository, um, including the uh, URL where that repository is located, uh, the name of the local path where you'll be checking that out, and also the version of the code. So the tag or the branch uh, or the hash that you want to check out. And I'll get into a, a little more detail later about uh, what changes you may have to make. So same diagram again. Um, basically, when you do a Git clone, you get the top level app. But that's the very bare bones kind of structure for the entire UFS system. And you really need to run manage externals to get all the different subcomponents. And so when you run uh, the script called manage external slash checkout externals, um, this will kind of retrieve all these different repositories for you and pack them in where they need to go. Um, and so this kind of just shows the, the organization of these subdirectories and sub subdirectories and how they're organized and how they're all uh, kind of taken so that they can work together when you're running the UFS medium range weather app. Um, but occasionally you'll want to do, uh, you may want to do development simply on one of those sub repositories instead of checking out the entire uh, app. And in that case, um, since manage externals is only at the top level, um, you'll need to do a, a so-called recursive clone since all this is handled through sub modules. So basically it's the, the same git clone command you give it a different URL to point to one of these sub -reposit these repositories underneath the uh, medium range weather app umbrella. And you give it this dash dash recursive tag. And that tells Git basically, instead of just checking out that repository, I want every repository that's also linked underneath it. And so finally, uh, we get to the important part. So how do we make changes and contribute code to the UFS? <coughs> And so this has been mentioned in uh, the seam talk earlier, um, but for quick and easy changes to small parts of the code, you can take advantage of the so-called source mods capability of seam. Um, when you create a new case, uh, there's a directory named source mod slash, in this case, it's source UFS ATM for the UFS atmospheric model. Um, for other apps, it may be different and future releases may be different. Um, and this is created by the create new case script. So you can copy one or more files from the source code, make adjustments to them as you see fit, and then you run the case.build script. And instead of taking uh, the files from the source code, uh, Seam will see that there are some files in this directory and build with those instead. Now, this is really only intended for small, easy, and importantly, temporary changes to the code in the UFS components. Uh, for more serious development work, we'll get into in the next slides. So contributing code back to the UFS for development work, you really need to change the source code directly where it resides in the repository. Um, for the medium range weather app, um, the source code is found in the, uh, in the source slash model directory. Um, this my UFS sandbox is just the directory that we told, uh, we told Git to check out the repository into that can be named anything. Um, so, uh, in this example, we'll make a change to the UFS weather model repository. And so the first thing you need to do is create a fresh copy of the UFS medium range weather app. And then uh, before you run manage externals, you need to switch uh, to the main branch of each repository. So I showed you what the externals.cfg file looks like earlier. And you can see that there's these tags that say that it, it is checking out the tag that says UFS dash v1.1.0. Um, when you're doing development, now the, the released code is version 1.1.0, and it's been frozen for some time now. By the time you want to start your development, uh, the main branch, developers and scientists have been working on this for months. Um, so the main branch is going to be far ahead of the release branch as far as its capabilities and uh, different fixes that may have been made. 
Um, so what you'll want to do is change the externals.cfg so that it points to the develop branch rather than the UFS v1.1.0 tag. So you would change these lines where it says uh, tag equals UFS v1.1.0, and you would instead say branch equals develop, or for some repositories, it would be branch equals master. Um, you must then create a fork. So you may not make, want to make changes to every one of these repositories, um, but you will want to, if you are going to make changes to any of these repositories, as we mentioned, you will want to have a fork for that repository. Um, so again, in this example, it's going to be the UFS weather model. Um, so if you haven't done it already, uh, you would go to the URL for the UFS weather model website, um, and you'd hit the fork button to create a fork. And then once your fork has been created, you can modify externals.cfg to check out your fork instead of the authoritative repository. And so uh, you saw in the previous slide um, where it says repo URL, the repository URL, instead of UFS community, it'll now say your username. So in my example, it's uh, UF instead of UFS community, it's mkubulich, for example. And finally, then you'd run manage externals uh, check out externals to check out the code as usual. This time, however, instead of cloning the tags, uh, the release tags, so the released version of the code that's officially supported, you're cloning these, uh, the, you're in, in the uh, one, in the UFS weather model, you're cloning your fork, and in the other ones, you're cloning, um, you're still cloning the authoritative repository, but in all of them, you're, you're checking out the main branch. You're not checking out this release tag anymore. Um, and using the process described earlier, you would make your code modifications, modify the text, uh, maybe make multiple commits. And finally, once you're happy with it, you would push your changes back to your fork on GitHub um, using the git push command. Um, once your changes have been pushed back to GitHub, you're you can now open a pull request. Um, so you'd visit your fork in the internet browser and click pull request. Um, what it'll show when you open a when you go to open a pull request, it may uh, it may show that there isn't anything to compare. Um, that may be that's usually because you just don't have you haven't specified the branch that you want to open the pull request with. So in this case, we created a we created a, a branch called test and we made our changes there. So I'd select the drop down menu and click tech test. And then after selecting the correct branch, I would hit create pull request. And then it's time to uh, have your moment in the sun. So uh, you'd create a brief but descriptive title uh, in the first box. So you have a, you have a title bar here and then a, a big box full of uh, either full of text or, or blank for you to fill in. Um, so you'd want to create a brief but descriptive title in the first box that basically would tell people, give, give people an idea of exactly what you're changing, um, whether that be a, a bug fix to a certain part of the code or a new capability. Um, and in the larger box, you would add more details about the changes and their purpose. Um, for PRs that consist of many commits, this is where your own commit message history can come in handy. So you, it, if you have been including descriptive commit messages all along, then this step is a lot less work. Um, for sub -repositor some repositories, the UFS weather model included, the message box will be filled in with a template. Uh, when you first open your pull request. Um, in those cases, you should follow the instructions provided in that, in that template. And finally, when you're finished filling in all the details, you hit create pull request to open the PR. Now your work isn't necessarily done now. So you need to be prepared to respond to questions or concerns from code managers and other community members. Um, if, they have change, if they have requested changes from you, um, you can actually, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the, the text got cut off there. Um, but uh, you make your requested changes to the code um, so that your pull request can be approved. Um, now you'd make these changes uh, through modifying the existing branch. So when you open a pull request, it's those, it, it is tied to a specific branch in your fork. So if you need to make changes to that pull request to the code that you want pulled into the main repository, you simply add new commits to that branch and put it, push it back to GitHub. And uh, I just included a, 
uh, an example of a pull request that I've opened in the past. One of my colleagues made some suggestions. Um, they were they were good suggestions, and so then I pushed changes to that same branch, and GitHub noticed that the branch has been updated, and now the pull request shows those additional changes, and those will eventually be incorporated when that pull request is accepted. As far as testing requirements, this varies from project to project. Um, so most UFS components, or I should say many, um, but many, but we hope to eventually have all components of the UFS have some kind of official testing system uh, for ensuring that changes to the code are working correctly and do not break existing capabilities. These are typically called regression tests. Um, the UFS weather model has a fairly extensive set of regression, a fairly excessive regression testing system. Um, that's described in this URL, which is in the, the, the wiki page for the uh, UFS weather model. And regardless of the repository, uh, whatever tests are specified, those need to pass before changes can be accepted into the repository. Um, as I mentioned, the, ex the example I used is for the UFS weather model, but different repositories have different requirements for PRs. Um, and I'll briefly discuss those in the following slides. Um, now, the, uh, the FE3 Dynamical Core repository, um, I've, I've included links here, but uh, basically it's, it's a, a fork of the repository that GFDL is doing uh, de active development on. And EMC sort of pulls in those changes occasionally. So this is the location where changes to the Dynamical Core should be done for community members. Um, so there's no official regression testing suite yet, unless uh, uh, unless I have outdated information. Um, but making changes to the dynamical core are definitely going to require some testing. So you'll need some thorough justification for the changes, um, and you'll need to either test to ensure that results will not change, or if results will change, you should definitely prepare be prepared with a scientific justification for the differences. Um, for seam. Um, that is handled through uh, the, the URL given here. Um, they have a, a kind of a well uh, a well oiled machine of uh, development process. So before any uh, starting a new feature or other development, you'll need to open an issue and assign yourself, uh, assuming that you're planning to make those changes. Um, you would create a branch from the latest version that passed all tests. So they actually have continuous integration set up, which is a set of automated tests run through GitHub. Um, so if you have questions about that, you should definitely check out the SIEM developer's guide. Um, it'll have a lot of information that is, is too much to cover right here about exactly where, what starting point you should be starting from when you're making your changes to the code. Um, and like many other uh, repositories, it does have a set of regression tests that must be performed uh, and passed before opening a pull request. For UFS utils, um, which contains uh, the change res cube um, and may contain more components in the future that are used by future releases of the medium range weather app. Um, the uh, requirements for contributing code are that an issue be opened prior to opening a pull request, um, just basically announcing what, what you're planning to change. Um, code changes must conform to NCO implementation standards um, and that's linked here. And there's actually a lot more details in the repository wiki that I've linked here um, about the specific requirements. Um, and it does require regression testing on a number of platforms before, before the pull request can be merged. For UPP, uh, the Unified Post Processor, again, it's technically not part of the app, but it's included in the NCEPLIPS package for the global release. Um, making changes is described in, in this uh, GitHub wiki page. Uh, basically, to make changes, you would create an issue, um, open a pull request, and then you would contact one of the code managers to conduct the specific regression tests. Um, and finally, for CCPP, um, well, Dom's going to talk about that in the CCPP talk coming up next. Um, so here's my final slide. Um, there's uh, some links to Git and GitHub documentation. Um, thanks, everybody, for your questions uh, and for your attention. And uh, I, if I have time, I'll, I'll answer any questions now. Okay, Max, thank you. You don't have time, but uh, if anyone has questions, please ask. We have a 10 minutes break. If uh, it's okay, you please feel free to take break. But if you do have questions, uh,
please ask now or in the section this afternoon, we do have a discussion section, one and a half hours, we can ask questions there. Yeah, I have a question. This is sure. sorry. So you mentioned that uh, how to contribute to the UFA. So, so I want, because we have like, um, how do we know which component in like, uh, you mentioned like in C, in CCPP, the, like, the, like we have atmospheric, we have land component, we have ocean, uh, or we have those things. So, how to know which one is in which? <laughs> Probably see the same question. Um, so the the modifications that you make to the code, um, so you'll you'll actually have to make those changes in the individual repositories. Um, <clears throat> it's usually, <clears throat> sorry, um, pretty self uh, self explanatory and obvious um, where those changes are, but it's it's not necessarily obvious. Um, as far as uh, finding out where exactly those uh, that that specific part of the code is, um, you can use uh, kind of command line tools uh, such as uh, grep to kind of search through all the files for say the specific line you're looking for. Um, it's I guess that's kind of a more a more general question um, as far as uh, figuring out how to make those changes to the code. I, I I guess I didn't, I, I kind of glossed over that part, but um, I, I guess that would be, that would be kind of answered on a case by case basis. And it would uh, kind of pinpointing where changes should be made is gonna, is, is really gonna depend on exactly what change you're making. Um, especially because you, you announced, uh, you mentioned the ocean component and that's not, the ocean model is not part of the UFS medium range weather app right now. So adding, adding a new component um, is definitely gonna be a very different, uh, uh, process from modifying existing components. And I, I, I didn't actually touch on that here, um, but I would recommend uh, kind of asking in the UFS forums about stuff like that if, if, if you're having trouble finding that information. Also going to, a, if you at least know what repository you're looking at, um, going to the, the wiki page there and kind of uh, browsing through, and, and actually I, I uh, realized I never showed um, an example of a wiki page, uh, but I can uh, present here unless my computer freezes, which is of course going to happen. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, that's my uh, just more like a general question because I think I will work on the net component at that in the CCP. I just wonder if uh, not the the net component or the other components. So. <laughs> Should I like work on the CCPV or like the different things? Like the, uh, so, so like I mentioned, uh, Dom will be talking next about yeah. the CCPP. Um, they, they like all the other individual components have their own development process. Um, that is, and theirs is actually fairly well documented because they have a very collaborative effort going on with different institutions and different models. So, um, so yeah, that I, I would say, uh, if you have questions specific to that, you hopefully Dom's presentation will answer that for you. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we should let Mike take a break <laughs> and uh, we will continue question and answer this afternoon. Yeah. Oh, and, and I, Jorge, I, I see your, uh, your message now. Um, I can. I actually did prepare slides on those, but I took them out because of uh, time constraints. But I can uh, show those slides briefly this afternoon about um, how to kind of keep your fork synced with the main repository. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, for everyone still here, we will start next session in five minutes, 11, US, 11 a.m. in U.S. Mountain Time.
Uh, hi, Dom, are you on at the moment? Dom, are you on at the moment? Okay, great. Just about to ask you to share your screen. So I can see your presentation. If you could go full screen for us. Yes, I'm just trying to figure out how to get to the controls for mic and everything. I'm oh, okay. Okay, you yep. should be able to see my full screen presentation now. Uh-huh, that looks good. Uh, could you advance a few slides just to make sure it's working? All right, that's looking good. Looks okay. So let me just see. I want to just show my video briefly before we get started so that people know. Okay. You got it. Can you see me? Yep. Yeah, that okay. looks good. Yeah, I've got a second laptop here so I can sort of uh, um, check on as well what's happening. I've been kicked oh, okay. out of a, of a Google presentation once in a, in a conference without knowing it because I was in full screen. Right, so I'm right. giving my talk happily for 15 minutes and then realized that I was going <laughs> in the third slide. Like that. Yeah, hopefully it's we won't let that happen to you today. So, Yeah, it won't because I've got my second laptop here. Okay. That's right. So, Okay, great. Well, we're just hanging out for two more minutes. Um, thanks, Tom. Sure, no worries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, good morning again. This is 11 a.m. and we are going to uh, start our second session this morning for developers. Uh, Dom uh, Hanzila will give us uh, a talk now actually about CCPP. Dom, please go ahead. 
Right. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to switch on my video quickly so you know who is speaking. I'll turn it off now to save bandwidth. Um, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time today to talk about the CCPP um, in the context of um, what developers need to know in order to contribute code. And um, we're going to start off slowly with a bit of a recap of last week because um, some people might not have been there and there has been a pretty turbulent weekend in between. So um, maybe it's good to catch up again and remind you of some of that. And then it's getting fairly involved. So depending on how much um, you have been working with Git or with the, the UFS, mm -hmm. um, not everything will make sense to you in the beginning, but don't despair. It's um, mm -hmm. it's there for you. So you can always go back and check it and then, then ask questions in the appropriate places. So um, um, before we get started, I want to mention my collaborators here. Um, we are sort of the, the group who is developing the CCPP framework and the CCPP physics most actively. We sort of initialized, um, initiated that project um, and got the first bunch of physics into the CCPP pool. And um, you now we're helping other people and trying to advance the framework as we go. So just to warm up or recap from last week, the role of the CCPP and the function in the modeling system and sort of going also back to the philosophy and the standardization that um, we are requiring. So you heard that the CCPP is the chosen infrastructure for the physics development in the UFS with the specific goal to facilitate the improvement of physical parameterizations and their transition from research to operations by enabling the community to participate in development and testing. Now that's quite a bit of a mouthful, um, but fortunately you have seen all this in Grant's excellent talk last week. So here on the right side, you have this little sketch that shows the place of the CCPP in the in the UFS modeling system. So the CCPP framework sits underneath the atmosphere <clears throat> and it connects um, to the pool of CCPP compliant physics. And these ones are in different um, GitHub repositories, as you know already, and they're just listed here on the left side again. Now, so the main goal, of course, is um, for the CCPP is um, to accelerate the transition of innovations um, from research to operations and also um, complete the feedback cycles from operations to research. So the main idea of the CCPP is to be model agnostic to ena ena enable collaborations and, um, and accelerate transition of innovations. For example, by lowering the bar to add new schemes or transfer them between models. And we've been pretty successful with hooking up the CCPP to a number of models. So it's already in the UFS, it's in Neptune, it's currently in transition into the CESM and then MPAS. And we also made it an essential part of the hierarchical system development framework by implementing it in the single column model developed here at DTC, where um, you can really look at processes, individual time steps, see how one physics um, parameterization interacts with another. And so the bottom here, um, just to remind you what the basic concept of the CCPP is, it's, it's all based on these metadata tables that sit on the host model side and also on the CCPP physics side, one per scheme. And um, these metadata tables describe the variables that are provided by the host model on the one side and then requested by the physics on the other side in order to do their job. And the CCPP framework at compile time um, matches those, analyzes those tables, matches them by a property called standard name, and then generates the whole bunch of, of caps that connect the atmosphere driver with the pool of physics. So the main point here of the main point for the CCPP is really to increase interoperability. And so the first question we need to ask ourselves um, if we want to develop physics and really understand what's going on and why things are done in a certain way is what makes schemes interoperable? <clears throat> so um, a couple of points here, and then I'll also mention how this has been achieved or realized in the context of the CCPP. So we need well-defined and documented entry points so that developers know what kind of data goes into a scheme um, what comes out of the scheme, which data is modified, which data is just read, which data is completely overwritten. It's important to know these kind of details. You also want to know um, things like, um, what is the unit of the variable? What's the, what are these, the dimensions and, and things like that. Um, second, the readability, oh, let me just put this up here. So <clears throat> yeah, to this, to this per for this purpose, we really um, weighed heavily on this, on this concept of the metadata and declaring variable intents and using export uh, explicit import statements to also make sure where certain functionality, certain calls come from. The readability of the code that not only facilitates debugging, but <clears throat> but also makes it easier for the for the auto generator, the, the code generator to parse it correctly and then do the right thing. So things like private and public declarations, um, 
Then another one is um, exposing constants and tuning parameters from the physics to the host model. Um, it doesn't make any sense to have all these tuning knobs buried somewhere deep in the code where you need to know exactly in which file you have to go on line 3017 and then change this one thing. So by exposing constants and tuning parameters um, and making them available to the host model, you, you help the developers and the users um, to understand where something is coming from, how it, how it can be changed. And you also ensure consistency across physics. It doesn't make sense to have three or four different values for the Stefan Boltzmann constants in the model, which um, exists in some places. Another one is to avoid the use of derived or compounded data types, um, which really helps with interoperability because if you're using complex data types that you're passing into the physics, then you basically require the host model to do the, any host model that hooks up to the physics and run this piece of physics to, de, to define these data types as well. Whereas on the other hand, if you stick to standard Fortran data types, then you don't have to do much because those ones are known to any host model. And last but not least, um, standardized error handling and communication. Um, that really means that you don't make any assumptions on how the host model is logging its output, how it's handling errors, how you have to stop the model. You don't make any assumptions on um, the parallelization strategy in the model. And um, <clears throat> that, that really gives you, the, gives you the ability to run this physics elsewhere without breaking a ton of stuff. And then one of the other things we are doing um, is um, to test and develop these physics um, with a number of different compilers on different systems and with different optimization flags, which is usually a good idea to do because even the best single compiler out there misses stuff. So coming back to um, CCPP schemes, what does constitute a CCPP scheme? So any piece of code um, with, a comp with a CCPP compliant interface that can be added to the CCPP physics as a scheme must be wrapped within a Fortran module. It must contain the three mandatory routines in it run and finalize. And it, if one of these is not used, it's just an empty stub that needs to sit there. But at least those stubs need to be there. And it must contain CCPP readable metadata describing the argument value variables for all subroutines that do any work. If the, again, if these, if these functions are not, or these subroutines are not doing anything, then there won't be an argument table for it. As I said beforehand, you have to use the CCPP error tracking variables rather than printing in, printing to standard output or stopping the model forcefully. You have to have formatted scientific technical documentation using Doxygen markup, and you have to conform to modern coding standards to some extent. Um, there's a question about scheme independence. What should, what should be comprised in one scheme? What should be broken up? So we generally say um, it should be the smallest functional unit possible. Um, or if you want to read it differently, if there are certain scheme functions that will always be called together, it's okay to keep it as one. So for example, you have your own convection scheme and it's bound to be called for shallow and deep convection all the time together. There should be no, no difference and no different um, combination with another um, convection scheme. In this case, it's okay to keep it as one and just call it with one entry point. If um, the scheme functions, however, should be able to operate independently, for example, by combining GF shallow convection with the SAS deep convection scheme, then you need to put them in separate schemes. And sort of as a side note here on the right is um, interstitial schemes, which I'm going to cover on the next slide, um, need to follow the same rules. So, Interstitial schemes, what is the stuff? Why are they needed? So the context here is that in the CCPP world, all physics related code must be callable using a CCPP compliant interface. And the reason is basically our, our mission statement, the interchangeability, standardization, interoperability, and the ability to combine physics in different suites. Now, if you want to use the GFS physics in other host models, then um, all the code that has been the GFS physics driver or GFS radiation driver files um, this, that needs to be part of the suite and it must be callable from the CCPP. So one could ask the question here, well, if we need everything in GFS driver, why don't we just take the GFS driver themselves and make this a CCPP scheme? Well, obviously it drastically reduces flexibility for research. It, it requires you to pass in all these GFS derived data types and whatever else you have. So it basically um, goes against the CCPP idea of being able to put physics in different, in different models. So um, what we did is when we, when we created the CCPP, um, we at DTC, we were responsible for figuring out how to divide up all these thousands of lines of code that were in the GFS driver 
drivers into schemes that somewhat made sense and then also worked, gave the right answers. It's important to note that the solution that we came up is not unique. It's certainly not the, the best solution. So if you have any improvements, any suggestions on how to combine things differently, break them up better or combine them better, it's you're most welcome to um, approach us uh, in form of a PR or just an issue on GitHub or whatever um, using our forum. So the guidelines and the processes that we followed when we came up with writing these interstitial schemes, and I'm, I'm listing them here because that might help you when you when you encounter that same situation. Um, we had we made a use or we found that there is a useful distinction that we tried to reflect in the in the names of the suites as well. So uh, interstitial schemes can serve multiple purposes. One of them is it can they can specifically augment physical parameterization. So they're really scheme specific. That mean that could be additional functionality beyond what a scheme code provides, but it's still tied to one specific parameterization or one class of of, um, of physical parameterizations. And so there's a bit of a gray area um, where you have to decide what belongs into the primary schemes or the actual physics scheme or what goes into an interstitial scheme. But um, that's really something to decide on a case by case basis. The other category is what we call suite level interstitial schemes. So those ones are more or less tied to the suite or the host model rather than individual physics. And they, so they contain functionality on top of a class of schemes. They can connect two or more schemes together like real glue code or they can do things like conversions, initializing sums, applying tendencies. So um, here in the bottom, you have a little snippet. It's like an example from one of the G one of the supported suite definition files where you have an example for a pure GFS suite interstitial underscore three scheme that is really specific to the GFS suite. And then there is a GFS deep convection generic pre interstitial, which is sort of in between. It's somewhere between, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's part of the GFS, but it's for a class of schemes of deep convection. Um, and then you call the primary scheme. And there could be another one that would be something like SAMF deep convection underscore pre, for example. And that would be um, totally scheme specific in this context. All right. <clears throat> so I mentioned coding standards. Um, and as I said, they are primarily for portability, readability, and also the ability to parse it with the um, with our code generators. So the code must comply to modern Fortran standards, and we are explicitly allowing Fortran 90 all the way to 2008, which means um, we do not allow common blocks and go to statements are strongly discouraged. We're aware that there are certain places where go to statements are needed, but uh, as long as they can, if they can be avoided, they should be avoided. It's also better to use modern syntax like use MPI, use OMP lib, um, use net CDF instead of include MPI after the age, stuff like that. Um, as, as Grant mentioned last week, all external information required by the scheme must be passed in via the argument list. So do not use things like use first cons comma and then gravitational constant or something like that. So this should come in via the argument list. Use explicit import statements. For example, if you use a function to calculate um, um, saturated water, water vapor pressure or so, then you use fun, func first comma only and you list specifically which kind of symbols you're importing. This makes it so much easier for everyone um, to track down where a piece of code is coming from. You also need to use labeled end statements for modules, subroutines, and functions. So for example, if, if your new CCPP scheme comes in a module scheme template, then the module must end with end module scheme template. This is required for the CCPP parser, the framework generator, to function properly. And you should use implicit non. Implicit variable declarations are a nightmare, and they have caused so much trouble in the past. So it's really time to get away from this. Another important point is that <clears throat> and we can stress this often enough, if a variable is declared as an int and out variable in the Fortran code, then it must be set entirely and every time when this routine is called. This includes the mandatory variables, error flag and error message as well. So it's important to watch out for partially set int and out variables. For example, variables that are only set if certain conditions are met, because these ones must be int and in out. That's not only good practice, but it's also needed. And I'm going to show you an example later why it's needed. And then last but not least, um, there can be no permanent state of decomposition dependent host model data. That means data that contains like a horizontal dimension or something like that inside a module. So you can't use those variables and save them in the, in the, in the routine using the save attribute. So this is most, these, these coding standards are specific to the CCPP, but they also comply or fall under the coding standards that um, 
now an NGGPS came up with, um, and you find an, a URL down here, which you can look at um, later, that describes all the coding standards for the UFS in general. Okay, so fortunately, Mike already paved the way with his um, excellent introduction to GitHub and using developmental branches of the code. So it's obvious that we can't really, we have to go to a different version of the code if you want to do model development. And the reason is that the UFS medium range by the app is not suitable for, for developmental purposes because the code is frozen and is lagging the latest development versions from lower. And the same workflow also doesn't provide sufficient functionalities to support the development, in particular, the unit and regression testing procedures, which you, which you need to use in order to <clears throat> send code back to the authoritative repositories. So um, the, the entry point for, for using the UFS weather model standalone and making your code changes is, um, or developments and then um, presenting them back is listed here. And there's an excellent wiki that's maintained by EMC that um, gives you a lot of information on how to check out the code, how to build the code without the app, how to run the regression tests, how to compile the code, all these kind of things. So um, I'm going to, in a nutshell, only have two slides here, one on compiling, one on regression testing, and this is certainly not enough, so you need to you know, refer to that documentation. So if you, if you wanna compile the UFS weather model standalone without the app, you do what um, Mike said before, and you do a git clone minus, or yeah, you do a git clone minus minus recursive, and then you type in or copy and paste this um, entire URL. And then if you're lucky enough that you're on a supported platform, which currently is um, basically every, every NOAA RDHPC system and also um, Cheyenne, then you can just go into a subdirectory called tests and then run a, a script called compile.sh with a machine tag, which is usually machine.compiler. Um, and then you've got a, a, a make opt strings on option string, which has CCPP equal yes, and then a, an optional argument called suites equal, which is a comma separated list of suites by their suite name. And here's an example for three of them. And then there are three optional arguments. One is a label statement. If you just use empty quotes, then you get then you get an executable called fv3.exe and modules.fv3. If you put a one there, for example, you get um, fv3.exe and modules.fv3.one. And then there are two additional optional arguments for cleaning before build or cleaning after build. And they're yes by default, but if you want to avoid recompiling everything, especially when you're just trying to debug errors in your code, then you can say no and you'll get a much faster compiler. Now, in order to, come to send back code, it will have to pass regression tests. And we have a fairly extensive set of regression tests that need to be run on a number of platforms now. Most developers don't run, run all these tests by themselves. Some of them don't run any of them. Um, and then the code managers have to do that. But if you're on a system that supports that, that's a smaller subset of a subset of what I um, listed before. And so basically Hera with Intel and GNU, Orion with Intel, WCOSIS, where most people don't have access to, and then Cheyenne also with Intel and GNU then you can run those regression tests by yourself. So again, you go to the test subdirectory, you need to set a, an environment variable account number, which um, is the project you're going to charge for running those tests. And just to give you a ballpark figure, it's around 800 to 1000 um, core hours um, to run the full set of regression tests at the moment. <clears throat> and if you want to switch from the default Intel compiler to the GNU compiler, you would set export RT compiler equal GNU. Then depending on which compiler you use, you run a script called rt.sh with a bunch of arguments. And then you sit back and relax. It, it takes about an hour or something like that, maybe a little bit longer if, if your fair share or your, you know, your priority is low because you exhausted your, your core hours already. And there is, um, again, there's excellent document, documentation on the UFS weather model wiki um, under this URL. Um, so I encourage you to go there and read that. So, I really don't have time to cover all this in detail. So, because I really need to add, uh, really want to focus on how to develop with the CCPP. And so I want to talk about adding new schemes in the next couple of slides. But before we go there, better stop and see if there are any pressing questions right away. Ming, do you see anything on Slack? I don't have Slack open. I didn't see question from Slack and the chat and uh, let me double check and uh, we, I check presentation and the develop session. Okay, uh, no question from Slack and uh, <laughs> any question from, yeah, can, can speak up now actually, thank you.
Okay, well, that's good. Um, either everyone's asleep already or I'm just totally overwhelmed. So let's get started. We are going to add a new scheme to the CCPP. That's very exciting. And we are going to do this with a very simple scheme, which we call QGRS debug. So the scenario here is, um, suppose for the moment that there is some process, something in the physics that is writing bad data into the four dimensional tracer array. So your variable Q, it's called QGRS in, in, in the UFS. That's why I'm told, I've chosen this name. So something in this, in, in this array is suddenly bad and you've got bogus data in there. So the question is, is it bad physics? Is it a memory leak? What's going on? So the old way you would be doing debugging um, in, in the GFS would be to put print statements and GFS physics driver of F90 and possibly other files, depending on um, you know, where, the, where the problem could come from. And if that gets to tedious, you would be able to, you would be probably writing small Fortran include files and then um, include them in certain places with pre preprocessor directives. So this requires you searching and edit, editing multiple files and then recompiling the code. And there's quite a bit of potential for um, copy and paste errors as well. So the new way with the CCPP is to write a simple CCPP scheme that just does some diagnostic stuff. In this case, you're allowed to use diagnostic output to standard out or standard error because you won't be feeding this back to the code. It's just for your own debugging purposes. And once you wrote this, the scheme, you can add calls to the suite definition file in, in any place where you think you need it. So you can really narrow it down by iteratively um, putting those putting those 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 calls to that diagnostic scheme there until you know where it happens. So our little scheme QGRS debug would be something like that. It's in a file called QGR QGRS debug.f90 module QGRS debug. And it's got the three mandatory CCPP entry points, but because in it and finalize I'm not doing anything, I just I don't have space on this slide, I didn't put them here. But the one, the one routine that we are going to use is QGRS debug run. It's got three arguments, QGRS, then the two mandatory error messages, which are also initialized properly here. And then um, our debugging in this simple example is just printing out the minimum value and the maximum value of the entire array. And then as you know from last week, um, here are the CCPP hookups, these, um, <clears throat> these um, arc table QGRS debug run, and then the HTML include statement, which make the code generator look for the metadata file and then try to find um, the metadata for these arguments. So that's on the next slide. This is QGRS debug.meta. It's got the table headers, the CCPP table properties with the name, the type scheme, any dependencies. There's a dependency on machine.f because we are using kind fis, which is the stand default physics kind, a real physics kind in, in the GFS code. And then there is the argument table for the underscore run routine, which has three variables QGRS and an error message and error handling further down. And you've seen this um, in the past. So once you, you wrote these things, how do you tell the host model to um, include that in the code and, and, and compile it? That's pretty simple. Um, in the checked out code, you have to locate a file called fe3ccppconfigccppprebuildconfig.py. And in there is, that's a Python file. In there is a list that is called scheme files. And you simply have to add that full path or that relative path from the fe3 directory um, to that file, to the Fortune file. There's no need to add any dependencies because this is done in the scheme metadata. And we can also skip over optional arguments. <laughs> And once you did that, the only thing you need to do is to <clears throat> um, open your suite definition file and add the calls to the QGRS debug in the, in the appropriate places where you think you need to do that and then compile the code as usual. And you can recompile without cleaning that will greatly speed up um, that compile time. So, and that's basically it. So you're out in the sun sitting on the beach and enjoying your, enjoying your cocktails. So that's the ideal story, but often things don't go that well. So what do you do if you encounter problems? One of the problems when you, when you develop with the CCPP is of course that you have to write not only Fortran code, which can break the compile, but you can also break the, the pre-built script by you know, making a mistake in the metadata, for example. So when you run compile.sh or even rt.sh, that CCPP framework code generator, CCPP prebuild.py is called automatically. If it fails, then you will find an error message in the compile log or in your job log from rt.sh that says an error occurred while running ccp prebuild.py check and then a full path to that file. So obviously that's what you're going to do. You have to open this file. Um, the out file is generally empty, but the error file contains everything. That's just how 
Python logging module puts outputs the data, or puts outputs all, all its, its text. So you can go there, you can scroll down, you can look for um, error or critical or capitalized. That's sort of the standard error messages from, from the Python logging module towards the end of the file. And that should, that should tell you what went wrong. Um, you can then also try to run ccpv prebuild.py manually instead of kicking off compile.sh and rt.sh all the time um, by going into the descending into the fe3 directory and then running this script here. So the one mandatory argument is the path to the config and you can specify the suites with the same values like fe3, gfs version 15.2. And you can also specify a minus minus debug flag which gives you a ton more output. So this is pretty useful. Once you get past the point of um, have of CCP prebuilt to Pi and it and it succeeds, then you can keep going and you can you can look at um, other compiler errors, for example, from your your new Fortran code. Okay. <clears throat> now there's a couple of, of 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 things that I would like to mention that we added to the CCP um, in order to support developers doing their work. So one of the one of the things is the automatic unit conversions. We have um, we implemented that in the CCPP because we want to expedite development and transitioning of innovations. It's not worth rewriting a piece of code just because or writing, rewriting a lot of code because units are different and then trying to find out it's not worth it because the scheme doesn't perform and there's no future for it in the UFS. So the idea is to enable the, the CCPP framework to do that conversion for you. And then if it really becomes necessary um, to change it later for operational performance um, reasons, then you can always make the change later, but at least you know that it's worth making it. So here's an example from the real world where we have um, cloud effective radii that are stored in micrometers in FV3, uh, whereas the Thompson microphysics scheme on the other hand wants them in meters. And the CCPP framework knows about this difference because it's encoded in the metadata. There's an attribute called units. So when it generates the, the caps at compile time, it knows that it needs to convert one to the other. And if it has a conversion registered for this particular, for these particular two units, which it has, then it will do something like here on the right. It will allocate a temporary array and then assign that that REI is times 10 to the minus six to that temporary, to that temporary array called the Thompson microphysics scheme and on exiting scales back. So this is where, where this warning comes in, beware of your variable intents, because the CCPP is smart. It knows that it, it knows if a variable is intent out, you only have to allocate the array. You don't have to do that convers, convers, conversion because it's going to be rewritten inside completely. So it's going to skip that line. Conversely, if a variable is intent in only, it's not going to do that conversion on exiting the, the, the microphysics scheme. So if you if you get the intents wrong, then you will get invalid data. So that's why beware of the intents that you're using. Really, really check what what your scheme is doing. So one other thing is, um, <clears throat> CCPP knows if an array is supposed to be allocated or not based on the active attribute that um, Grant mentioned last week, and that I'm also going to um, talk about again in a couple of slides. And it will skip invalid operations. So if CCPP knows that this this um, array REIs is not allocated for that for that set of physics or for that set of parameters or runtime configs that you have chosen, then it's not going to do that conversion here. It will just call the Thompson MP scheme with an empty stub. <clears throat> How do you know that this happens? Because um, you want to make sure that you know your unit conversions are correct or not. Well, you look into the output of the CCPP prebuild.py script. If a unit conversion um, is 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 registered, so the CCPP can do that conversion for you automatically. It will log an info message, something like automatic unit conversion from Celsius to Kelvin for a certain variable before entering a certain scheme. If it can't do that conversion because it doesn't know how to do it, um, it will spit out an error and it will abort the CCPP prebuild.py run. And in this case, um, you contact the CCPP developers and see um, what the best way forward is, if we should implement it or if, um, someone or if you need to change your units. Okay, another one is um, the inline document, documentation using Doxygen markup. Um, so it has been mentioned several times that CCPP physics rely on that inline documentation to generate a complete scientific documentation. This is mandatory. We haven't really um, enforced this a lot in the past, but we are going to get more strict with that. Sorry about it. Um, 
we want we want to make sure that we only accept pull requests that um, that have documentation. So if you add new code or if you change existing code that requires changes in the documentation, please make sure that you you do that as well. Um, it was mentioned last week that the CCPV metadata, so these HTML include GFDL microphysics and score on HTML statements and so are included um, in order to generate variable tables when the scientific documentation is generated. So you can see that on the next slide, this is for the GFDL cloud microphysics, where you have some text that's coming from the inline documentation and then the argument table that is generated automatically from the metadata tables. <clears throat> One of the things that developers often struggle with is, um, especially when putting together new suites, um, is um, which parameterizations are using a variable and what are they doing with it? And for this purpose, CCP prebuild.py is generating two files at build time. So every time this, the prebuild script is run. One is called ccpp underscore variables underscore fe3.tech. So this file contains a list of all variables that are used by any of the physics in the suite definition files that you are compiling into the executable. If you use compiler's h as shown before, then you will find this um, file in the path that I, that I copy and pasted here. You'd have to go there, you'd have to run PDF LaTeX over this file a number of times until that usual warning message labels may have changed, rerun the, to get cross references right is gone. And then you can open that PDF in your preferred PDF viewer. And you'll get something like this. So here's an example, there's a variable with standard name air pressure difference between mid layers. You get the long name, you get the units, you get the rank, the type, the kind. You also get the source, so it's defined in module GFS type defs in, as part of the GFS interstitial type. And the local name as it's known to the host model and the FE3 ATM is also pasted here, but it's full glory. And then there's a list of schemes that re request this variable. So that's very useful. Another file that um, ccppreville.py is generating is a list of all variables provided by the host model, independent of the choice of the suite definition files. And that's in an HTML file um, listed down here. So this gives you an idea of, okay, these variables are available. I can, um, I can, I can use those when I write my new physics. Okay, so now that we are armed with all these tools and the basic knowledge on, on how to write new schemes, we can boldly go to where very few developers have gone before, and that's um, how to modify or construct new suites. So in order to do that, um, we can take a look at the existing FE3 GFS version 16 beta suite in its full glory. It's pretty small on the screen, but I hope you can see it. Um, so this is um, three columns and it covers really everything from the first to the very last column of physics. So I, I want to point out a couple of, of, of aspects here. So first of all, that opening suite construct, which has the name as an attribute and also a version tag as an attribute. This is different from the version tag that you find in the UFS medium range, medium range weather app code because it has changed recently. But this is the new correct version to use, version equal one. There is the support for the different groups of physics, as you heard from last, in, from last week's talk. And so each group has a name tag. In this case, the group name is physics. And then there, is, there are the other groups called fast physics, which is sort of optional. Then there's time vary, radiation, and stochastics. And we'll talk about some of the differences in a little bit. <clears throat> There's also the subcycling construct, which we use in the GFS suites for um, implementing the surface iteration loop. And Grant described that in detail last week. And then of course, there's the list of schemes. So here for the radiation group, it starts with a GFS RRTMG pre, that's like a suite interstitial. And then there is a scheme interstitial RRTMG shortwave pre, and then the actual scheme and the posts and so on. So, a few things to keep in mind when changing or constructing suites. While the CCPP allows you to change the order of schemes in the suite definition file, it does not guarantee you, doesn't guarantee you that the physics will be correct. And that's because of the interstitial code in between. So some of this interstitial code depends on the order. So when you change the order, for example, you swap the order of short range and long wave uh, and uh, short wave and long wave radiation. Look inside these pre and post schemes and make sure that um, there is nothing that prevents swapping the order. Or in this case, you could also just run two tests and make sure you still get the same results, for example. Um, 
So always check the interstitial code if there is something that needs to be modified um, when you change the order. The better your interstitial code is, which means the more modular it is, um, the less dependency on different schemes, so maybe hopefully only one scheme, and with good documentation, that will facilitate the process, but it will make the sweep definition file longer breaking up these comp compounded interstitial codes. So it's a bit of a trade-off and um, people really need to look at the certain, at, at the specific case that they're dealing with. And then again, um, the, those three files that I talked about, two files basically, CCPB variables underscore fe3.pdf and HTML, those help you identify which schemes read from or write to a variable and which variables are provided by the host model in general. Additionally, <clears throat> when you're changing a suite definition file, then in many cases, it also requires you changing um, additional files, runtime configuration files for the model. One of them is input.nml, the name list, must be consistent with what's in the suite definition file. Now, this is an unfortunate situation that we have, and we are working hard to get, to get away from this. But for example, and you will see this in, in one of the next slides, if you change from GFDL microphysics to Thompson microphysics, you also have to make consistent um, uh, corresponding switches in input.nml to be consistent. And then there are additional files, like for example, the field table that specifies the trace that are going to be used that also depend on the choice of microphysics. Adding physics in the fast physics or time vary group is much more difficult and um, then for the, for the standard physics radiation or even the, the stochastics group and should be done together with the CCPP developers. The reason is that the fast physics are tightly integrated in the die core. They use a different set of variables and it needs to be engineered um, together with the die core people to make this work. So that's really something that is, is quite difficult at the moment, but we are working towards simplifying this as well, especially in light of what you heard last week that more physics will be tightly integrated in the die core in the future. And for the time vary group, there's one difference that has to do with um, the data storage model and how the physics are called for um, over individual blocks, so all blocks at the same time. Um, so that's also a bit more difficult and um, we're working on simplifying this part as well. One thing that we will not be able to get away from at the moment is um, particular to the fast physics group. Um, <clears throat> or better to say to the to the split of the split up of the physics into different groups anyway. So developers cannot add or remove groups in the suite definition file, except for the group fast physics, which must be removed if the do saturation adjustment flag is set to false and input an NML. And it must be there if do saturation adjustment is true. All the other groups are hard coded and they need to be there because the CCPP um, hooks in the FE3 ATM model rely on these groups being there. It's calling these groups explicitly. All right, now let's take our little QGRS debug scheme that we developed beforehand and add them to our sweet GFS version 16 beta for the purpose of tracking down our, our process that's corrupting the QGRS array. So it's generally, so let's say for the moment, it's got nothing to do with radiation. It's quite likely anyway, it's gotta be some somewhere in that big, um, physics group that sort of starts at the, head, at the top of column two here, and then runs all the way to just before the stochastics group. It's generally a good idea to, bra good idea to bracket this down incrementally to find out where something happens. So you would, for example, start with adding a call to QGRS debug after the two reset calls when everything is sort of ready to go for passing the physics uh, or running the physics. You would put one call there as your starting point and make sure that's, that your QGRS array is still okay. It's also a good idea to put one between GFS surface generic post and GFS PBL generic pre. This is sort of a natural split between everything after until after surface um, physics and then before PBL and convection and whatever else you have, free atmosphere physics. And you could put one in the end and whether you put that before the maximum hourly diagnostics or afterwards doesn't really matter. Um, just somewhere around there after the microphysics. And then you would start you, um, putting more more of those calls incrementally until you narrowed it down um, to, to that scheme that, that really causes the problem. So that's quite simple. All you have to do is you have to recompile and you can do, you can recompile without, without um, cleaning the code. So you get pretty fast turnaround. Another example I wanted to show, and I mentioned this before, is how to replace GFDL microphysics with Thompson microphysics. So if you do that, you probably want to first copy that existing suite definition file 
and then rename the suite and also the file name because you know that those those have to be consistent. So you would call that suite fv 3 gfs version 16 beta underscore Thompson and the file name would be suite underscore and then the whole name here dot XML. Um, you'd have to you have to comment out the group fast physics because this only works with the GFDL microphysics at the moment. So you just comment it out using XML tags, totally fine. Or you can delete it if you like, it doesn't matter. Um, and then you have to either comment out or delete that scheme GFDL cloud microphysics line and replace it with those three lines, MP Thompson pre, MP Thompson and MP Thompson post. Now keep in mind what I said beforehand, if you swap the microphysics scheme, you have to make um, corresponding changes in input.nml and field tape. So in input.nml in the die core part, you have to set that saturation adjustment flag to false. You have to switch IMP physics from 11 to eight, which is from GFDL microphysics to Thomson microphysics. And then you have to make a choice whether you want to use the aerosol away version of Thomson, in which case you set this flag to true, or whether you set it to false or leave it because I think the default is false if you want to use the non aerosol away version. Now, if you choose to use the aerosol aware version of Thompson, then you should use initial conditions that contain aerosol data. Because otherwise, if, if those ones are not there, um, it will apply some default profiles that have been derived um, over the mid plains in the, in the continental United States. And those profiles don't make any sense in many other parts of the world. So if you don't have aerosol initial conditions in, if you don't have aerosol data in the initial conditions, it's better to set LT aerosol to false. And then, of course, as I said, you also need to update that file containing the tracers, um, which is called field table. And fortunately, we have a whole bunch of regression tests that are run as part of the UFS weather model. So if you look into these regression test scripts, or even, you're even able to run them yourself on, on the appropriate platform, then you can just pick one of these configurations, like the field table, and then and use it in your, in your tests as well. So this was quite a lot already. Um, that's as much as what I wanted to cover before the lunch break. Um, and then after lunch, we will um, sort of um, tackle our big summit for today, which is sort of the host site coding um, that might happen to you if you if you have to add new variables for the CCPP or add the metadata for it. So let me stop here and ask for questions. OK, OK, thanks. Um, there are quite a bit of information. Any questions Any from listeners? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, please unmute yourself and ask. OK, actually, I, I do have one. I can start. Go for uh, it. Tom, if you go back one slice. <laughs> so, I see there is a group, group name called radiation. Is that part of physics? Why it's outside the CCPP, right? I just confused. <laughs> no, um, so that's historical. In, in, the, in the old GFS model, there were two different drivers, physics drivers. There was a radiation driver and there was an everything else than radiation driver. And one of them is called radiation. The other one was called physics. Just, uh, that's just uh, historically. So radiation are, are of course also physics, but they are a separate group because they run first and then the DICOR does, and then the host model does something else or can do something else. And then the physics group is called. Okay, so it's part of CCPP, it's just to call yes. a different name. Okay, thank you. Everything that's in the sweet definition file here, let me go. Everything that's here is part of CCPP. Okay. Including that fast physics, that, that saturation adjustment for the GFDL microphysics and DICOR. It's also part of CCPP. Okay, so it's just called a different name. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, hi, Dom. This is Ligia. I was wondering if you could say a few words about uh, the, the stochastics group. Um, People have noticed that the stochastic physics is distributed outside of the CCPP. It is its own code repository. So maybe you could just clarify what is the role of having stochastics called here through the CCPP? I can, I think you certainly could do that as well, but let me try. Um, so the, the stochastics code that sits in its own repository um, that is also called separately and has nothing to do with the CCPP, this, this code, generates per, um, perturbations, patterns that can be applied to the, to the physics itself. 
to physical fields. Um, the application of those patterns to the physics, this is what happens in that group stochastics down here on the, on the bottom right. So in this call GFS stochastics, that's, that's where these patterns that are, that are generated in that external code block are applied to the physics. And what you see here, this physics tendencies, this is a remainder from, um, that's going to be something that I'll, I'll, yeah, that's something I'll be covering in, in the second half of, of my presentation after lunch. Um, that's just a, a little helper tool for, for the CCPP um, for developers. Does this make sense roughly? Yeah, thank you, Dom. If there are more questions, then people can, can follow up. Yeah, we've got like 15 minutes un unless people want to head out for lunch earlier. So um, if, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask now. Now is your chance. Hi, this is Sharon. Um, is there any idea, uh, intent for organizing those name lists in the input.nameless file by the physics suite? So it's very obvious that you need to set these and but those don't apply because they were GFDL, but Thompson, I need these. I was just curious, is that already happening? It's not happening yet. It's in the planning. It's okay. part of the okay. statement in our statement of work for until next June or something like that. So one of the obvious, one of the obvious issues here is that if you choose my Thompson microphysics in the suite definition file, like in this example, then certain number of of switches need to be made in, in the input name list, at minimum the ones that I put here. So if there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between those name list flags and what's in the suite definition file, then it doesn't make sense to have to specify it twice. So we are working on, on a mechanism that, that takes the suite definition file contents and sets these variables automatically and correctly for, for you. So those one would not show up in the, in the name list anymore. And then with respect to splitting these by processes or by, by scheme, it's already happening to some extent. So the GFDL microphysics has its own nameless section. The, um, that was another one. Um, the, the unified, gra the gravity wave drag and parameterizations have their own nameless section. Others like MYNN surface and PBL have quite a lot of um, nameless parameters that we are sort of considering moving this into its own nameless sections as well. Um, how this is going to be implemented in the end, whether we want to have the ability to specify this as part of a suite definition file or not is something that's yet that's to be discussed. Because you can imagine the suite definition file is already three columns, I don't know how many lines that is long. And if you add more information here, um, for example, things like nameless parameters, tuning parameters, it becomes unreadable. So we need to find a we need to find a good way to, to implement it in the future, but it's, it's in the planning and we're actively discussing this with the other CCPP framework developers at NCAR. Hi, can you hear me? This is Grant. Yes, we can. Yeah, I was just gonna add one more thing about that. Uh, and this isn't widely implemented, but in some of the uh, initialization phases of some of the schemes, some of these nameless uh, options are checked um, for it. So if you, if you try to run a scheme and, a certain nameless uh, value has not been set, it will air out. So, but like I said, that's not uh, consistent across all schemes, but that is a little bit of a fallback for, for some schemes. Yeah, thanks Grant. So certainly if you have the group fast physics in your suite definition file and do saturation adjustment is false, the code will um, abort. And vice versa, if you don't have the group and you have do saturation adjustment equal to, the code will also abort. So this, this error will not happen. I think you're pointing out that it's even tricky. How do you name these suites? Because this Thompson, it's just the microphysics. You're not discussing what the PBL and the turbulence is. So, you know, it's a package and you have to go somewhere else to read what is in that package, perhaps. Yes. Um, I mean, you're welcome to put comments in XML format here. You just use that um, left angle and then exclamation mark dash dash. And then you can write comments at the header of the suite where it says this suite is this and that. The name that I came up with here, and this really just you know as an illustration is okay. This is the this is the operational candidate for the GFS version 16, 16 implementation, but with the Thompson microphysics scheme. So quite often you find in the repository that there is sort of a, a root name which is an operational version of a suite or an operational candidate like an established suite, um, and then there is a variation which is something like underscore whatever in in, in the end. 
Okay, thanks. That that does help understand. Okay. Any more questions for Tom? Hi, Tom. Uh, actually, this is yeah. Okay, go ahead. Hi, I have a question about the um, pre and the post schemes. So, do they perform like uh, calculate the um, variables that are used in the main scheme, like the uh, Thompson scheme, and the post is like producing the diagnostics? Oh, this is a good, yeah. There is no no single answer for that. It really depends. So, for the Thompson scheme, um, in the Thompson post scheme, there is a a, a feature called a tendency limiter that has nothing to do with, with diagnostics or so, which just means that Thompson can be sometimes overly reactive and produces huge tendencies in terms of temperature, especially when the time step is, is large, which makes your model blow up. So uh, you were using this temperature, temperature tendency limiter in the post scheme that will put a lid on the tendencies that are coming out of, of the Thompson scheme and keep the model um, stable. That's one example. If okay. you... Um, if you look at things like RTMG shortwave pre and shortwave post, there's an entirely different story. The shortwave RTMG shortwave parameterization itself requires a compounded cloud um, data type or array, which has um, all the cloud properties in a nine-dimensional array. And this is not how the, the data is stored in the model in general. So it's usually broken up into the individual components, like you know the albedo, the diffusivity, and stuff like that. So um, this, um, this pre-routine takes, collects all these, these individual arrays, puts them in this nine-dimensional cloud array, then runs the short ref physics, and then, um, then distributes the updated data back into the, into the original arrays. So that's kind of this data massaging that happens before certain schemes to work around um, specifics that are not host model, that, are not, um, that, are, that should be independent of the host model, but are not. Okay. And um, there's a bunch of others um, that, that do diagnostics. Um, a lot of these, that's, where is it in, in the surface generic post, for example, or in the maximum hourly diagnostics. Okay, sounds good. Thank you for the explanation. If there are no more questions at the moment, um, I suggest we break for lunch early. Um, you can take your time if questions are coming up during the lunch break, you can ask them after lunch. We went through about 32 slides and I have another 15 or so to go through. Those ones will be fairly complicated, so it's good to catch, catch uh, some fresh air maybe and um, then be refreshed for the second part after lunch. Okay, Tom, thank you. And uh, we do have a, a couple minutes. I uh, Can I actually share my screen to talk about uh, Slack channels for one yeah. minute before our lunch break? Go for it, sorry, yes. <laughs> yeah, no problem. And uh, I will share my screen and uh, then my Slack channel. Okay, uh, everyone see my Slack channel, right? <laughs> Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So, and uh, so basically, if you see here, we do have this developer session and the feedback. We all we already use practical, practical and uh, basic presentation and general a lot. And uh, if you click add channels and browse all the channels, we can see actually we do have this one, one, two, three, four, five, six channels here, and. Uh, we have 47 members and uh, in presentation and practice. We have 12 members on feedback and 16 members on develop session. Uh, maybe before after lunch, if you have uh, one, two minutes, please add in yourself to this uh, uh, developer sessions and the feedback sessions. And this afternoon, we certainly can use more of these two channels to give us feedback or the developer ask questions. Uh, for Dom and uh, other, even other actually, uh, ex subject expertise. Okay, that's all I want to say. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, let's have a lunch break. We will come back at uh, 1 p.m., basically one hour, five minutes, in one hour, five minutes. Thank you.
So while we're waiting for the others, we can start off with a little quiz. Um, anyone knows which mountain that is, its name and how high it is? <laughs> I was going to ask what this is actually. Let's see if it's on Earth, Earth, right? How about Olympus Mons on Mars? Yeah, that sounds pretty good. How high is it, do you know? Uh, at that, I don't know, 40,000 or something like that? Uh, it's 22 kilometers, something Oh like my that. gosh. So a factor of <laughs> wow. three of Mount Everest, roughly. Got a little picture to compare the extent of the mountain. Couldn't get unmuted in time to answer, but in grad school, I, I was uh, doing simulations with the Martian atmosphere, so it's in my wheelhouse. Okay, nice. Wow. Yeah, in my previous life, I was an astrophysicist as well, so. Okay, time to back to your current life, right, Dom? Yes, exactly, okay. <laughs> Well, the reason I put it there is that um, every talk or a sort of every tutorial needs a summit to climb. And um, this is going to be our summit for today. Um, I'm going to talk about host side coding in the next um, half an hour or so maximum. And then we've got plenty of time for questions and answers to scratch our heads and discuss issues around the CCPP before we sort of move into the general discussion at about two o'clock. So one o'clock, one hour from now, it's 2 p.m. mountain time. So I hope you all had good lunch, dinner, breakfast, midnight snack, wherever you are, and you're refreshed for this next 30 minutes or so. <clears throat> all right, oh, jump straight into it. After we know how to create new physics schemes in CCPP, how to hook them up to the host model, let's talk about um, the host side coding. <clears throat> so in many cases, most cases, physics developers do not need to change the host model code. The only exception that we discussed beforehand is um, modifying the CCPP pre-built config file as shown before. But that's not really coding because that's a Python configuration file and not a Fortran code. There are a couple of scenarios that require developers to make host model changes. One of them is an existing variable on the host model side is not yet exposed to the CCPP. That means there is no metadata for it and it needs to be added. <clears throat> The next one, a new variable is required for physics computations. Remember that in the CCPP currently, every, every variable that is, that is used in the physics must be allocated by the host model on the host model site and then passed to the CCPP with a standard name. And lastly, a new or an existing variable must be added to the model output for inspection, for example, in the diagnostics or in order to, um, to achieve restart reproducibility. So we're going to start slow and then gradually ramp it up as we scale our mountain, our Olympus mounts. So the first case I'm going to discuss here is um, adding an existing variable to CCPP. When I'm saying to CCPP only, it means um, only to the metadata, not to any more Fortran code. So case number one here, the existing variable is a standard Fortran variable. It's not a member of a derived data type. So it's kind of a module wide module type variable. So a typical examples therefore are constants or flags or anything else that is sort of a hard coded parameter. So what you gotta do on the host model side is you have to locate the module in which the variable is defined and add the variable to the module metadata table if it exists. And I'm going to show you on the next slide how this looks like. Actually, let's go there right away. So here's a module table that exists already, gfs type diff stuff dot meta. You have seen this quite, quite often. And these are the module scope variables. They are in the CCPP arc table with the name of the module where the type is module. And one such variable there as an example is a variable called LTP that is an extra top layer for radiation, which is hard coded to zero. So it's not, there's no extra layer in the GFS, <clears throat> but this would be one example for an, a standard fortune variable that is not a member of a derived data type. If the module that you're looking at doesn't have a metadata table yet, you would have to create one from scratch. And the easiest is, of course, look for an existing metadata table and just copy it. So you can always start from GFS type devs.meta, copy the, the bare bones that you need and strip out all the rest. You need to add <clears throat> the associated Fortran file to the CCPP pre-built config in a list that is called variable definition files. And the reason is 
that CCPP uses this list that parses all the Fortran files, looks for the CCPP hooks, this backslash R table, and so on, and the backslash HTML include, and then jumps into the metadata file and parses those. And this, this set of, of files that's listed here in variable definition files, that makes up the unity of all the host model variables um, that are known to the CCPP and that can be provided to the physics. Are there any questions on this before we go to the second case? If not, let's go to case number two. <clears throat> case number two is pretty similar and it's the most, the most common scenario that a developer will hit, I assume. The existing variable on the host model side is a member of a derived data type, mostly one of those GFS derived data types that, and the derived data type itself is already known to the CCPP. So an example here would be the orography M variable that array call, that's a, that's called Oro as part of the surface property GFS DDT that in the full scope of the model is, um, can be referenced as GFS underscore data and then colon. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to this later surface prop person oral. What you have to do is you have to locate the module in which the DDT is defined. So in, in this case for the GFS DDTs, again, that's in GFS type of stuff meta. So you have to search for a CCPP arc table that starts with GFS surface property type, and then look at all the entries that in the, are in there. And one of, one of these entries in our case, it's already there, is the oral array, which is a standard fortune variable with a name, dimensions, rank, units, and everything else. And you would take, you would pick um, an entry that is closest to your needs and then just copy it and change the, the, the entries as, as required. So all you do is you add the variable to the DDT's metadata table and you're done. Um, there's an extra credit <clears throat> and that refers to something that Grant mentioned and I also mentioned earlier, um, the active attribute. Same scenario, the existing variable is a member of a derived data type the DDT is known to the CCPP, but the variable is allocated conditionally. So in order to conserve memory, not all variables are allocated at all times. They are allocated dependent on certain physics choices, for example. So in this case, we are talking about a variable called TREF, which is also a member of the surface property type. It's a reference temperature, sea surface reference temperature, and it's only allocated if the NSSTM um, physics, which you heard about last week, is run. <clears throat> and the way this is controlled in GFS type does start at 90 is here on the left, that's the code snippet. If model percent NSTF underscore name one larger than zero, then allocate surface property TREF. As I alluded to beforehand, when I discussed unit conversions and other features, it's important for the CCPP to know when an, a variable is allocated or not. So in this case, when you add a variable, um, you have to take this Fortran expression and convert it into a logical expression that um, in Fortran syntax evaluates to true or false using the standard names of the variables. So what you have to do is for this variable, you have to add an attribute active, and then you look for the standard name of this part of the variable, model percent NSTF underscore name one. You will find this in GFS type def meta and it has the, the name flag for NSSTM underscore run. So your active attribute in GFS type def meta will be active equal and then flag for NSSTM run larger than zero. And this active attribute line will take any kind of Fortran expression that evaluates to true or false um, on the right side. <clears throat> and here's a link, um, we added documentation about the active attribute recently to um, the CCPP technical documentation. So if you wanna read more about it, um, see the details behind the scenes. So then please go there. Okay, now it's getting a little more tricky. This time we are adding a variable to the CCP, to the host and the CCPP, which means, um, or well, case three in this case, which means we have to add a variable that does not exist on the host model side yet. Um, and we need to add the variable itself in the Fortran code plus the metadata for it. The easiest case is discussed here is case three. The new variable will be a member of a derived data type that already exists on the host model side. So the derived data type exists, the variable itself not yet. This is the easiest case. So most likely developers will find the derived data type that they, that they are looking at in GFS type devs.f19. That's usually your best starting point. So what you do is you add the constituent array to the type definition. 
you allocate the data and you initialize it following the existing examples in, in that file. And if it's a variable in the diagnostic or the interstitial GFS data types, then just follow that code to also reset the variable if applicable in the, in the correct places. And it's always a good idea to just pick the closest variable, existing variable to your needs and follow that example and then just search for that variable or through the entire file and wherever it pops up, you, you, re you replicate what, what's done for that variable. The biggest question here, and that's the, where it gets a little tricky, is um, what is the purpose of this variable? Is this variable a, a persistent variable that needs to exist for longer and consume more memory? Or is it an interstitial variable that we, where we can use a different um, GFS data type uh, in order to save my memory? <clears throat> And in order to understand the difference, we have to look at this little picture on the right side. Remember beforehand when we talked about, um, about schemes and, and I mentioned this blocking idea in the GFS phys or in the FE3 atmospheric model, data is stored um, differently in, in discontinuous blocks. It's broken up into, into individual blocks and for each block, um, the data for all the variables in the, in the GFS data types is stored separately. And the idea for this is to improve cache, cache reuse and by that improve um, the runtime performance of the model. Um, what this means is that when you, enter a, when you enter the time integration phase for the physics, <clears throat> it first goes into the radiation block, the radiation group. It runs the radiation group for the first block then goes back, runs the radiation group for the second block, then goes back, runs the, runs the radiation group for the third block and so on until all N blocks, all, num all blocks have been processed. Only then it jumps on and does the same for the physics group. So these iterations can happen in serial if it's only, if it's only one OpenMP thread or no OpenMP threading, but if you use multiple threads, then this processing of, of blocks can happen in parallel too with maximum and N open and P thread number of blocks processed at the same time. So the key question is, what is this variable doing that you're adding to on the host model side? Look at, look at what's happened down here in the physics group. If you have a scheme in the physics group that writes to a variable, and then this variable gets used within the same pass through the physics calls, and then afterwards its value doesn't matter anymore, it's going to be reset upon the next entry into, into the physics group, then you're talking about a purely interstitial variable. In this case, you use the thread dependent GFS interstitial data type, which comes at the very bottom of the GFS type devs.f90 file. And the reason is um, that this thread dependent GFS interstitial DDT is allocated only n thread number of times. So one time if you don't use threading or four times if you use four open and P threads. Conversely, if you use any, other, any of the other GFS DDTs, that variable is allocated n block number of times. And usually the number of blocks is way larger than the number of threads. So that's an interstitial variable. The opposite is a persistent variable. A persistent variable is one that is, for example, written somewhere in the radiation and then read again in the physics, or it's passed on to the dynamics, to the IO, and then comes back into the physics for the next time integration. In this case, you have to use any of the other GFS DDTs. For example, the DIAC type, internally it's called int DIAC or the surface property type or the TBD type, which is the easiest, easiest one. It just means to be determined, I don't know where you belong or there's also radiation tendencies um, type. But in, in all these cases, you use one of these DDTs, only if it's an interstitial variable, you use the GFS interstitial DDT. Now it's important to understand this difference. So if there is a question right now, then I'd rather take it before um, jumping to the next slide. Hey, Dom, this is Grant. I don't have a, a question, um, but just a comment about the DIAG data type. Um, it's also a little special in the sense that it houses variables that get cleared periodically. Um, so if you're putting a variable in there, uh, know what you're doing, and that is going to get cleared periodically or should be cleared periodically. Yeah, that's right. So the diagnostic um, DDT is persistent in a sense that it survives from one time step to the next, but it gets cleared um, based on an on a on a value or on a parameter in the input name list, input.nml. Um, basically, every time diagnostics get written out of this this variable, 
um, will be reset to zero. Oh, that's that's kind of the idea behind it. Yeah, thanks for for reminding me about that one. So purely persistent, go to surface property, TBT, rat tent. If it's a diagnostic variable where resetting it at diag output times is fine, then you use di int diag or diag as it's called here. And if it's purely interstitial, then you use the GFS interstitial DDT. And if you have questions, ask before you um, spend too much time on it. Now that we understood this, this, this part of the process, let's go to the next complicated case. <clears throat> That's case number four. The new variable that we want to add is a member of a derived data type that doesn't exist yet in the host model, or the new variable is itself a derived data type that doesn't exist in the host model. So most developers will not encounter this situation, except if the new variable that they're adding, the DDT, is, should become a member of an existing DDT. And the typical example for this is, for, is um, the surface flux long wave type in the GFS radiation tendencies type. In this case, what you do, and I'm going to show this in the next slide, you follow the previous instructions to add a member to a DDT, only that this member itself is a DDT, and then you add the metadata for the new, D, for the new DDT as well. All the other scenarios are not covered here. These are the most complicated cases. If you really think you need something like that, you should contact DTC and UFS code managers and developers. But let's go back to this one where the new variable that we are adding goes into an existing DDT, but is a DDT itself. In this case, let's look at, at the right side first. So here's the GFS radiation tendency type that's in GFS type devs.meta. You have seen this example beforehand for the surface property type. And there is an, an entry um, that's called surface FSW, which are the shortwave fluxes at the surface. Um, it, everything is the same as if it was a standard Fortran variable. Um, the only thing is that the type is not real or integer, but the type is surface SW underscore type. If CCPP finds that when it parses the metadata, it will look for a definition in the metadata of that surface FSW type. <clears throat> And the way to register it with the CCPP is to go to the Fortran source code file that defines the data type. In this case, it's radiation shortwave underscore param dot f. And then create that metadata file for it if it doesn't exist yet with a CCPP table properties entry that has name as surface FSW underscore type, type as DDT. And then in the art table, you're describing all the constituents of the DDT so that, it, that CCPP knows everything about this DDT when it comes to parsing it and adding it to the auto-generated um, caps. So basically, it's combining two steps that you have seen before and already. So this is the most complicated case that um, we, we are going to discuss today. Um, we're now leaving that idea of defining new variables, but asking the question of, well, now we've got these variables, but I want to look at those. What do I do? So if you want to add a variable to, to the output, I call it a diagnostic variable here, but it can be really anything. Um, if it's a purely diagnostic variable, then it's best to use the GFS in diag type and GFS type test on 90 when it comes to making a choice where your component should go to that member. But the other persistent DDTs will work as well. You follow the above instructions for adding a new variable to the DDT and to the metadata as we discussed. And then you need to locate a file called gfs underscore diagnostics dot of 90 for outputting the data. Um, there'll be a hundred or so, 200 um, of these blocks that, are, that are, I have put here in this gray box um, that advance a, an index entry and then add a new variable to the output by pointing an external diag type to, an internal, to the internal variable that you want to output. So again, you choose an entry that is um, as closest to your needs, then copy and paste it and modify it as needed. So in this case, we are trying to output a variable which um, contains the maximum mass flux in a column that's required for M1 and PBL. This variable is a horizontal variable, so it's two, di two dimensions. Um, that's why percent x is equal to, if it was a three dimensional variable, percent x would be three. It's always misleading because you see only one column here, and that's just because all horizontal um, columns are sort of arranged in a one-dimensional vector in, in, in FE3, but that's just something you keep in mind. In any case, if it's a two-dimensional variable, you use x is equal to, and you use that x diag percent var two pointer. You just copy one that has the same access information and then um, modify it as needed. <clears throat> now, the other 
the other scenario I discussed beforehand for adding variables to output is restart variables. That's a little more complicated because there are two ways, at least two ways that I'm aware of how to do that. The option one is to add it to a special type called GFS restart type in a file called GFS restart.f90. And the other option is to modify another file in the, in the repository that's called fe3gf gfs underscore io.f90. The tricky thing is both of them require adjusting indices and dimensions and making changes in several places. So if you really think, if you think you need to do that, it's best to get in touch with the UFS code managers or UFS developers and um, do this um, in consultation with them. And DTC people can also help you with that. So one of these, what I wanted to discuss now is um, sort of looking behind the scenes, um, trying to understand better this block data model. So it has been a, a, consist, a constant sort of source of confusion on which horizontal variable to use in terms of CCPP standard names, where this all comes from and what it means. Um, so basically it all goes back to this idea to optimize cache reuse and improve runtime performance. So, and for this reason, um, the original developers of the FE3 ATM have decided on a storage model where a variable like the two meter surface temperature that is part of the surface property DDT is broken up into discontinuous chunks for um, NB number of blocks. So down here, that, that little square that I'm pointing at with my mouse, these are the NB number of blocks numbered from one to NB. And each of these little squares contains I am number of um, horizontal columns. Yeah. So your horizontal grid columns, IJ, whatever the value is, they are just lined up here from counted, counted from one to I am. This index here, this colon runs from one to I am for any given value in this, in, in the IB or yeah, for any, any given block here. So this thing here referred to, is this the, this extent here where each of these, these boxes um, represents one grid column, this here is referred to as the block size and the, and the entire block size in the CCPP is referenced as horizontal loop extent because that's how the, the loops in the, in the time integration phase are run. All these little um, block sizes summed up all together is the, is, the, is the horizontal dimension. So the sum of all horizontal columns that a, an MPI task or a process is responsible for. Now, because, the geo, because these entries here, these two meter surface temperature arrays and other arrays are allocated in such a way, when it comes to describing in, in terms of the metadata, what the extent of that array itself is, um, it's, it refers to the block size because each of these entities is, is allocated one to IM. So that means when, whenever you add a new variable to the GFS DDTs and GFS type devs .meta, you must use horizontal loop extent for the, to describe the horizontal dimension in standard names. And if you look at the, the later versions of GFS type diffs .meta, all variables have this nowadays. We corrected this a while ago. It used to be different and it was causing confusion. This applies to the persistent DDTs and it also applies to the GFS interstitial DDTs. So rule of thumb, anything in GFS type diffs .meta must use horizontal loop extent and not horizontal dimension. It's a little more complicated on the physics side. And that's why I'm spending so much time on this. Um, and that again has to do with the support for OpenMP threading in CCP in CCPP and that implementation of that storage model in FE3 ATM. So remember from what I said before, and in, in the time integration phase, the radiation group, the physics group, and the stochastics groups are called for individual blocks at a time, possibly in parallel using several OpenMP threads. This only applies to the time integration phase, the underscore run routines. During the initialization and finalization phases, so the underscore init and finalize routines, um, we are always calling this for all blocks at once because no threading can be used on the outside because a lot of the times in these phases, we calculate lookup tables, we read um, parameter files or um, coefficients for certain, for certain parameterizations from disk and you don't want to use threading for that. So by definition, initialization and finalization always run over the entire extent of all columns of an MPI task, but the run routine runs over one block at a time. I'm not going to discuss time variant fast physics groups. They are special and we are not, we're not touching them here. But basically what this means is that when you add a variable to the CCPP underscore run routines metadata, 
you have to use horizontal loop extent, just as you did for GFS type def sub meta. If you add the same variable in an init or underscore in, in an init or finalized routine, then you just swap horizontal loop again, extent against horizontal dimension, because this time you are going to parse all columns for the MPI task at once, not per block. Is this concept understood? Is it clear or are there any questions? Uh, hi, Dom. This is Hai Qin. Uh, I have a question. So, um, I, when I developed the, the country coupled model with CCPP, it seems I didn't uh, uh, identify the distinguish the, the horizontal dimension and the horizontal loop is turned uh, very strictly. So, uh, what will happen if I didn't follow uh, your guide? at this slide. Okay, good question. Very good question, Hachin. And probably applies to many developers who have used the CCPP in the past already. Um, this this um, strict enforcement only required from basically from now on or from very recently. Um, and, the, and the reason is that we have to implement some additional functionality to, to handle all these things automatically. If you were doing your development earlier on, it the, the CCPP didn't even care which, which dimension you put there, just the number of dimensions had, had to match. But we, it, it's going to care from very soon on. Um, we, had put, we have put some legacy um, code in there that would convert them back and forth, depending on what we know is needed mm -hmm. for the FE3. So if you, if, you are, if you are using horizontal dimension in underscore run routine now, um, CCPP prebuild.py will spit out a warning um, in, in its logs when it runs and says legacy extension, I'm, con I'm going to swap this in, um, to horizontal loop extent for you. And we are going to make sure that when new code is coming in, especially code like where we know people have been working on for a while, um, that we fix this together with developers. Okay, thank you. Nothing bad will happen for you for the time being, but um, once we merge it into the latest version of the code, we'll have to, um, we'll have to um, look at this, get it right. Okay, great. But we'll help you with that, so no worries. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna jump to the next topic here. It's kind of a bit of uh, out in the wild. Um, I wanted to discuss C debugging with CCPP because often when you develop code, you will run into problems and then you will want to debug it. So we have provided a couple of tools that aid the developers with that with debugging using the CCPP. And it basically follows the idea that was discussed above when we were just when we were talking about how to add a new scheme, adding the scheme QGRS debug. So we, we created a couple of debugging routines that are specifically designed for the GFS derived data types in the FE3 model. So if you look at this file FE3, CCPP, physics, physics, GFS debug.f90 and its metadata file, <clears throat> then you will find that there's a couple of routines in there. One of them is called GFS Diag to Screen. What this subroutine or the CCPP scheme does, it prints the contents of all the GFS DDTs except the GFS interstitial DDT, which you know by now what the difference is. So what it does, depending on how you configure it internally using preprocessor um, directives, and it's all described in there and at the top of this file, it will print min, max, or mean and mean values, or min, max, and 32-bit Adler checksum values, or the entire array elements one at a time um, to standard output. As I said, it's highly configurable by the user. You can change the code or the CPP directives in that file. You can add, modify it as you, as you wish. You can, um, if for example, if you're only, only interested in the second or third time step and none of the others, then you might just add something in there um, that you, that it bails out unless you hit one of these two time steps. Of course, you will probably not, yeah, of course you will not be feeding back these changes that are specifically um, added for your problem um, to in, in form of a PR, but you can always do those locally for yourself. There's also a routine called um, GFS interstitial to screen, which does exactly the same as GFS direct to screen, but for the GFS interstitial DDT only. And you'll find another, uh, a few more like GFS checkland, which we put in there in order to debug um, the RUC LSM. Um, GFS award, which allows you to stop the model at a certain point in time in the middle of the suite definition file and so on. 
add your own, whatever you need. And if you think it's useful for the others, then you may want to try to um, send it back in form of a PR. And again, the CCPP technical documentation contains information on this, and I put the link down here. We also added um, capabilities to output tendencies or any auxiliary data in from the CCPP to disk, basically um, taking the burden from the developer to tinker with the GFS diagnostics.f90 file that I uh, mentioned beforehand. So um, in the current CCPP code, you can output tendencies for temperature, UN weavent components, and traces, currently only um, specific humidity and ozone. Um, on a per process basis to disk. Um, per process means there will be one for one tendency for temperature for PBL, one for temperature for microphysics, and so on and so forth. The way to do that is to set um, a nameless option ldix3d22 in input.nml. This gives you T, U, and B. If you also want to have the traces, you also have to set qdix3d22. You cannot use qdix3d without ldix3d. So if you want the traces, you have to turn on both. But in most cases, this makes sense anyway. What you also have to do is you have to add the scheme first hand that I mentioned beforehand when we discussed GFS version 16 beta at the end of the stochastic group of the sweet definition file. This um, little routine creates sums of all the physics and non-physics tendencies. These are coming from the diker or from nudging and so on, and writes them to disk as well. That spares you from having to sum up all these, these tendencies by yourself afterwards. <clears throat> And then you have to add the variables that you're interested in to the diag table as well. Um, I don't want to discuss all the names of these variables here. I want to, I want, well, they, we have, first of all, we have documentation on this again at the URL that I'm, that I'm um, that I listed down there, but there's also a regression test that is called FE3 CCPP GSD diag 3 d debug, which you can run if you're on one of the supported platforms or you can inspect it and then look at that diag table because that contains all possible entries that all possible tendencies that the CCPP can output to disk. So you can just pick in whatever you want and add it to your diag table. We recently added a capability to also write auxiliary 2D or 3D data to disk and you can do that either time averaged or instantaneous values at the output time step. Um, that's also described in that URL below there. Basically what you do, there are four um, nameless options called nox 3 d nox 2 d and then aux 3 d time average and aux 2 d time average. Um, you set those as you like. If you want to output one three-dimensional field and two two-dimensional fields, you set nox 3 d to one and aux 2 d to two. And then you can specify a comma separated string in terms of with false and true values, whether you want to time average them or not. What you then do is you pass these 2D, 3D arrays to your scheme as an additional variable, like any other variable that you would pass to the CCPP using the metadata and the argument list, and then write whatever you want into that variable, and it will be written to disk for you automatically. So that's a neat feature because um, it allows you to bypass this um, mo modifying GFS diagnostics of 90 just for the purpose of outputting something and then reverting it again later. So to wrap this up, um, I hope I could convince you in the last one and a half hours of talking that writing a new scheme and adding it um, to a suite is easy. That changing or constructing suites may require a little bit of thinking because it may require changing, adding, or replacing interstitial code. Adding new variables can range anywhere between easy and highly complicated, depending on the situation. And as a side note here, if you need to define new variables, you will also have to define new standard names. And that's something that should be done in coordination with the DTC. We are currently preparing um, a, a, a guideline, like, um, like a set of rules that allow you to compose standard names following certain, um, certain standards, how to break up the name and then put things together. It's not yet ready. It has to be discussed and then formally agreed upon with many people. But once it's out there, you'll have a guideline that allows you to do this much more easily. I hopefully could also show you that outputting diagnostic variables is relatively easy, especially with the tools that we are providing and that registered variables are more complicated. And then finally, that um, the CCPP offers tools for debugging, outputting tendencies, and auxiliary data. Um, I know this a lot, so don't despair if, if it seems overwhelming. Help is readily available for you. Your one-stop shop for getting help is at the URL below of the dtcenter.org. We have extensive documentation we have a forum where you can post questions. 
We have uh, linked in quite a number of tutorials and we have a couple of presentations from conferences as well. This is basically what I wanted to discuss with you today. So I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions. Ming, anything on Slack? Mm, no, no questions on Slack. Hi, Dom. This is Xia. Hey, Xia. I have a question about the new output tendencies. Uh, for the GFS model to have these new output tendencies, does the model need to be compiled with the CCPP? Yeah, I mean, the Sony works with CCPP. Okay, got yeah. it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Thank there you. is some old code in the in the old version of how to run the physics, but that one has never been implemented. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> or at least, it, it, sorry, in order to avoid criticism, it was implemented fully once at a time, and then people would change this, and it didn't get updated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Dom. This is Haqin. I have a question about the unit of the uh, tendency output in the diagnostics. And uh, uh, a few, uh, few weeks ago, uh, Bao asked us to help him to uh, uh, make a, a switch run uh, with the uh, uh, UFS model V1 uh, public release. Uh, and he, he told me that uh, uh, the unit of the tendency, for example, the PBL or micro, microphysics temporary tendency, uh, it seems uh, his unit is increment. And I also checked uh, our latest uh, uh, NOAA GSD uh, uh, development. Uh, it seems our tendency output unit is uh, a, a degree per, uh, per second. So so what's the, the, the difference between these two uh, developing release version? <clears throat> well, that's a good question now because my memory is faint. So at some point we realized that, um, we realized exactly what you said, that the accumulated tendencies don't make any sense and that we need to divide it by the time step or by the total time um, elapsed so that we would get a, a real rate, like a real tendency as per second. I am not exactly sure which version of the code is in the public release. Um, hopefully Grant, maybe Lisa can, Help me out there. Um, I wasn't. I, I was under the impression that there was none of these tendencies capabilities there, but maybe maybe it is. But if if so, then probably it's the wrong version in the public release. But in the latest development code, you get tendencies as real tendencies as a rate per second. Yeah, just to chime in here, this is Grant. Um, I I think in the release version that the tendencies are are definitely wrong <laughs> in some sense, but this has been fixed in the master branch. And uh, just to okay. comment on, on the, the units, um, within the CCPP, uh, all, of the, all of the tendencies are, are uh, or all the variables that are called tendencies are just uh, accumulated um, changes. And they're only turned to tendencies when you divide by the the diagnostic uh, reset interval, and that happens, that's in in the GFS diagnostics to F nine. Yeah, that is true. We use that built-in capability in GFS diagnostics to F ninety to divide the accumulation and then reset it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, then, uh, so should I uh, suggest uh, Bow to switch to uh, our Noah GST developed version? I think it's generally he, a good he, he idea. The, the tendencies. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's generally a good idea if you do any development work um, that you use a later, a latest version or a later version of the code. Remember, the physics have been frozen in the public release in January 2020, so it's almost a year old by now. Yeah, yes, yes, because when we check the vertical profiles of the tendencies and the, uh, the results are quite similar, but the magnitude are quite, quite uh, different. 
yeah, so okay. I will start to use the uh, our latest uh, version. Thank you. So we have 31 participants in this call and I hope that someone else will be confused by what I talked about before and have some questions. Okay, uh, Dom, uh, I have a question. Uh, basically, it's more practical because uh, uh, to me, I may not uh, get into all these CCPP systems, but uh, when I run FE3 model or any model, I do need to know exactly what uh, physics <laughs> I'm using, right? And uh, usually it's, it's configured by my colleague. And uh, is there a log file or output file that can clear uh, tell me which physics suite I'm using uh, inside of this physics suite, which physics options I'm using, and inside each physics options, which parameters I'm using. Basically, a complete configuration that tell me what physics I'm using when I running when I running the model. I'm not basically configure or I just grab a model run like our case here. So is there a, this kind of log file or I have to basically get into the big log file that one log file or, or there, is, it, 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 is there this kind of information exist? Yes and no. So a log file exists. It's called log file dot and then a number of zeros dot out. This one basically captures the contents of the nameless input dot NML file and writes it back. With all the parameters, the 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 ones that are not specific uh, specified explicitly, um, are also added there with their default values. So that kind of a complete description of what was what's what was used um, based on input on NML plus default values. It also contains an entry called GFS uh, CCPP underscore suite, which tells you which uh, which suite you were using. It does not tell you the contents of the suite, so you have to rely on that the suite is the suite as it was as it is in, in, in the repository or in your code base and that you didn't modify it manually. We certainly should, and uh, it will come very soon when we switch um, when we switch over to this version of the CCPP framework code generator um, created by NCAR, there will be a, a much better documentation of what kind of physics we're run. There will be a complete output of the suite definition file with all its parameters and everything written to to the model log, in which way, in which way this will end up in the FE3 logs, whether it's part of the standard output or whether it will go into that log file 000.out, we don't know yet, but it will be available. Okay, thank you. It's good to know we are we are going to have this kind of log files that can easily check the details of physical suite. Yes, right now you have everything except the contents of the suite. So as long as your suite file has not been tampered with, then you can just come take that one from the repository and you know what you got, what you did. Okay, <laughs> most time I, I didn't really de directly deal with the code. Most time I just see the log files and the running results. <laughs> yes, and you're but, not about yeah. that, so. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, any more questions from? Yeah. Uh... This is Sharon again. Um, okay. I have a question about, um, have you discussed the idea of these CCPP packages um, providing software for other components outside of the atmosphere? So I, very specific to me, effective radius that I need to use for the CRTM. And I wanna be consistent with the physics. And um, I know the post right now has a routine. Um, is it going to be within the scope of those people developing those parameterizations to also provide outside user routines? I don't know if we can link libraries or I'm just wondering, is that part of the discussion? And then what JEDI is going to bring with their forward models? I mean, there's situations where you don't pass the information outside of atmosphere because you don't need it at every grid point, but then you got to go back and recalculate it's like a really complicated drive diagnostic, basically, and you want to be consistent with the physics. So I was just curious. Has that been discussed about what is the purpose of CCPP? Thanks. Yeah, uh, not to this extent, I would say. Um, 
because the CCPP sits underneath the, the host model, every communication with other parts, with other coupled, coupled components would have to happen through the host, through the coupling interface, which sits on top of the host model. And then of course you can do whatever you need to do. I don't know if this was exactly your question, but. Um, well, if, it's, it's that idea. So, you know, the, the people who develop that, that specific inline atmosphere use, are they also providing, it's kind of like if you developed a Python library, you have little utilities that somebody else can call. So are they gonna also have utilities that are consistent with their science choices that maybe the other components will need? That, that was just wondering if that was in the scope of discussion of CCPP. And it sounds like it's not, um, but I would request it if, if anyone was interested. Um, yeah, it's an interesting point. Um, I'd have to think a little bit on how this could be implemented best. Um, as I said, because we are always going through the through the host model itself, so the atmospheric host model, which is sort of the, you know, the carrier for the CCPP, um, there would be no direct communication um, from any of the other components to it. We'd have to, yeah, we'd have to engineer something and it has to be done in a way that it's host model agnostic and works across different systems. So that's always the, the um, constraint on, on this end. Well, but I'm, I'm wondering, does it even need to be that it's built with the, when the atmosphere is built, it's just that they write the software and it, it lives somewhere so that I know I can compile it and link to it and I know I'm being safe. So it's more like the module environment. You load that module version and you know you're being consistent. So um, if, you, if you refer to using specific routines uh, consistently between you know, atmospheric physics and elsewhere, then what, what we could do, what could be done is we could hook up the CCPP to that component just in the same way as we hook it up to the atmospheric component, you would have your little dummy suite that contains just one scheme for calculating cloud effective radii, for example. And you would call that scheme um, at your at the certain place in your in your component where you need it. That would be totally doable. That would be perfect. Yes. Yeah, because and, and you, I'm dealing you, with managing all these different codes that are all out yeah. of date from each no, other. No, absolutely. Um, uh, all you need to do is um, is is provide. Um, the, the storage, so you know, a location in memory that holds that data, but you will have this variable anyway because you want to use it elsewhere in your model. And then just call the CCPP from your little dummy suite from the component that you're working with. That's totally possible. Thank you, thank you, that's great. It would be actually an interesting example and uh, would be, be good for us to work on this. Well, what I'm wondering, I'm not inside Joint Center, I'm wondering, are they, just thinking about this for the future Jedi. That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, good point. Um, I, I may want to mention here as well, because you already went to this um, beyond the atmospheric component. Um, there is, I, I, I want to, oh, hang on. I want, yeah, this one here. So let's look at the bottom right here. There is a, an unfunded piece of work that needs to be done for the CCPP. Um, that is to augment the CCPP framework so that it can take an existing physics package, could be aerosols, could be chemistry, could be the land surface model, could be radiation, and then create either a CCPP cap, that the caps that we just discussed the entire last one and a half hours. Um, so the, you can call it inline from the atmospheric host model here, the blue dots that are connecting this, or in, or in addition or instead, um, create a new OPSI cap so that you could call it as a coupled component externally. So that's something we know we need to implement because that's required for the for the UFS. So that would also give you give you an option to call certain CCPP parameterizations outside the atmospheric model as an external component using an ESMF new OPSI coupling. But this has not been funded yet and still needs to be needs to be done, of course, the work. Well, if there are no more questions, um, there's a couple of things that I think um, we can we could we could talk about. Um, and one of them is just right on the slide here. Um, so, so Dom, there there actually is a break built in here. 
Okay. Um, for the next uh, 10 minutes. So it, you definitely can continue uh, at two, but I figure we can have a, a break to rest our brains for a minute before yes. the, uh, the okay. open question session. That's very good for me. So I can go upstairs and get a coffee. So okay, great. So everyone for listening. If uh, you have questions, feel free to, you know, use the resources I mentioned on the wrap up slide or shoot us an email or, you know, discuss it in about 10 minutes or so. Okay, great. Thank you, Dom. And uh, lots of good stuff here. Oh, okay, so let's take a break uh, 10 minutes and come back 2 p.m. Uh, mountain time. And uh, I think the next session, Mike will be leading the discussion and the uh, Q&A, right? Uh, sure, yeah. Okay, so two, actually, it's all yours. Start from two. Okay, thank you.
Okay, good afternoon, everybody from uh, snowy Boulder, Colorado. Um, this is our uh, our open discussion session. Um, basically, the the final um, hour and a half here today. We'll be ending at three thirty Mountain Time. Uh, basically, left open for uh, continued discussion about previous topics that were never wrapped up or um, questions that people may have or any other sort of open discussion related to the UFS, especially in a developer's uh, context, but really any any material that's been covered uh, this week. Um, since I interrupted Dom, I suppose I'll give the floor back to him uh, to continue um, to talk about some CCPP related stuff. Um, Dom, I think you wanted to to discuss some stuff on a slide. So you can you can go ahead and share your screen if you want to continue doing that. Oh, thanks. No worries, Mike. I was just trying to fill the gap. So um, it's all yours. OK, sure. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll start by asking if there are any questions um, that people have been holding on to. Um, if not, uh, I will definitely uh, take the floor and uh, show some slides that I did not get to this morning um, that are in response to a few questions that uh, some people had. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so some bonus slides. Um, so one of the things that I did not have time to cover this morning <clears throat> when I was discussing the, uh, the workflow of doing development in your fork and then pushing that workflow to uh, the main repository via pull requests um, was how you keep your, your fork in sync with the main repository. Um, so while forking does have a lot of advantages that we take advantage of in the UFS workflow, um, it does require some additional effort in keeping your fork sync in sync with the main repository. Um, and this is handled through uh, another bit of Git functionality that we did not discuss this morning, which is remote repositories. Um, so as I've mentioned a few times, uh, each Git repository, whether it's on GitHub or on your local machine, um, is a self-contained, entirely functional repository. Um, none is really, uh, from a software's perspective, any different than the other. Um, a, now, a Git remote is simply a link to another repository, um, either on disk or on the web, like GitHub or some other hosting service. So when you create a remote link to another repository, you can push to and pull from that repository, um, as I described in my earlier presentation. Um, and we were able to do this earlier because there is one remote that is automatically created when you clone your repository. So when you create a clone, you enter in some web address, uh, and that's where you're getting the code from. And when you clone the repository, Git remembers this location. Um, and by default, um, this, uh, this location is designated a remote repository with the name origin. And so if you use the command that I've uh, highlighted here, uh, git remote, dash v is just verbose, so it gives more information than uh, the traditional command. Um, and that shows us that the origin repository is, in this case, uh, github.com slash UFS community, UFS MR weather app. Um, and that is the, the origin. It's basically where the, where the, clone, the code has been cloned from. And so if you have a fork, um, obviously that origin is not gonna be the main repository, it's gonna be your fork. Um, so instead of github.com slash UFS community, uh, it'll say github.com slash your username. Uh, in my case, it's uh, mkvulich. Um, so here I cloned uh, a copy of my fork of the UFS weather model. Um, and you can see that like on the previous slide, the origin is github.com slash mkvulich slash UFS weather model. And that is my fork of the UFS weather model. Um, what I've done here is I've added a new remote um, that links to the main repository. And I called this remote upstream. 
And this can actually be called anything you want. Upstream is kind of just a standard naming convention that people use to designate kind of the, the authoritative repository um, of any project. And so by creating this remote, I now have two remote links from my local repository that's on disk. I have the link to where the repository originally came from, which is my fork on GitHub. And I also have a link to the upstream uh, authoritative repository, um, which is you also on GitHub, but it's under this UFS community organization. So once I create that remote, I can then fetch changes from that upstream remote um, in much the same way that I, uh, that I pull changes from the origin or my fork. Um, and I can do this with the uh, git fetch command. And in this case, I do git fetch upstream. And basically that tells Git, I wanna get the information from this upstream repository. So get all the information about all the different branches um, and see if they're different from what I currently have in this repository. And you can see when I did this command, um, Git went off to the internet uh, to the location that I told it to go. And it says, uh, from that repository, I found a bunch of new branches. Uh, I found some new commits and now they are available to you. Um, now, fetch does not actually take those commits and do in anything with them. In order to actually get those commits into your fork, your local clone of your fork, um, in this case, I want to update the develop branch. Um, and that's the main branch of, the repos of both the main repository and of my fork. And in order to do that, I use the git merge command. And here, I just did git merge. Um, upstream slash develop, so the upstream repository uh, and the develop branch. And I use this dash dash FF flag. Um, and that's really recommended when doing uh, these kind of operations, unless you're uh, quite experienced and are trying to do something fairly uh, exotic. Um, but the FF flag basically just says, only look for new commits that are not going to make my branch diverge from the branch that I am that I am retrieving these commits from. Um, so as long as you've been keeping your develop up to date and haven't been doing any uh, local development on the develop branch, instead you've been doing development on the on uh, feature branches that you've been creating as you go, um, it should be a very simple process. And you can see here I did the git merge command. And it says there's a that it's updating. Um, it's just kind of notating the the different hashes here, and it's doing a fast forward merge. So it's changing all these uh, these uh, files that have been changed in the upstream, the authoritative repository, um, and putting them onto my fork. Now it's putting them onto my fork, uh, this local clone that I have of my fork. So I do have to do one final step to sync with my fork that's on GitHub. So this is kind of a three-way sync. We're taking changes from the main repository, putting it into our local copy. Then we're taking that local copy and pushing it to our fork that's on GitHub. Instead of kind of moving from the main repository directly to the fork on GitHub, it's kind of a two-step process. Um, but then once you have these changes locally, you just do a git push to the origin. Again, in this case, the origin is the fork that we cloned from GitHub. And those changes have gone up to uh, the to the forked repository. So now, once this process has been completed, your all three repositories, the command line one, the main repository on GitHub, and the fork on GitHub will all be in sync in that one specific branch. And you can do this on multiple branches if you'd like, um, but the easiest way to go about it is to always just keep the develop or whatever the main branch in that repository is updated. Um, and that will, and only create feature branches, development bug fix, branches off of that develop rather than doing any changes on develop directly. And that way your fork will always be in sync with the main repository, so long as you do this on a fairly regular basis. Um, so yeah, did you, uh, I, I forget who asked that question, but uh, uh, were there any follow-up questions related to that? I know it's kind of uh, abstract and esoteric if you're just seeing slides with a bunch of commands on them, but um, it, it will definitely make more sense once you uh, go through and, and actually do it yourself. Hey, Mike, this is Dom. Hi, Dom. Um, 
I've never understood this, but it's probably just me. Why you need to keep any copies of branches that come from the authoritative repository up to date in your own fork? What I usually delete do is I delete them or just leave them alone and never ever touch them again. I don't bother keeping develop master whatever you have up to date because I'm always pulling stuff from upstream anyway. I don't need to pull anything from my fork and for that purpose only pull stuff from upstream, push it to origin only that I can pull it in from origin again. So is there any reason that I'm not seeing anything that I'm missing that makes this uh, you know, a beneficial or recommended process? No, and uh, I guess I should have uh, led with that. This is this is definitely not the only way to keep your fork in sync with the main repository. Um, it's kind of the standard process that I usually advise people because it's the most straightforward. Um, it doesn't involve uh, deleting branches and uh, potentially losing work if you haven't done everything exactly right. Um, but yeah, there there technically is no reason to uh, to kind of maintain any of these branches from the main repository, um, uh, unless your particular project, for example, is is doing some work in branches, and I think that's more of a more of a policy decision than a um, than something that's controlled by the Git software itself. If I'm understanding your question correctly. Okay, can I make some comments on Dom's question? Sure. Yeah, I think uh, there's a developer needs for this one because uh, when you fork, you're supposed to take maybe one week, two week, even half year to develop certain functions. During this process, I think uh, keep syncing you fork with authority repository will, will make your development more basically smooth when you want to push back. Uh, but uh, it, it's basically a, a a developer process that uh, you do need to keep thinking with other people. So that's basically the authoritative uh, repository. But uh, if you just start from fresh, you you just you and you can make your job done within very short term of the time. You don't need to think. But uh, I guess some folk will exist for a long time for because of development. See, Ming, this is the point where I object because. I can always pull the latest changes from upstream develop. I don't have to update my origin develop so that I can pull the changes from there. I can just go straight to the authoritative repository and get all the changes into my branch. The only thing I need to do for my development is make sure that the, the branch that I'm working on is up to date with the authoritative repository. I don't need to maintain all these other zombie branches in my in my fork. Yeah, Dom, this is Lori. I'll jump in and say I second your approach completely. I never keep develop up to date in my own fork. I use the origin or the upstream develop as my source. Yeah, and like I said, uh, the way I've described is far from the only way to do this. And the I think Absolutely. the I think the reason that I settled on on this as the the recommended way is uh, conceptually, I think it's the most straightforward. You're only ever dealing with uh, operations on a local branch rather than say creating a local branch from a remote branch, which is uh, technically not any harder probably, but um, it, uh, it's, it's mainly just a conceptual thing. And if people have, uh, have their own workflows that work for themselves, that's, that's certainly okay. Um, it's just a matter of, of ma making sure that people who are, are not as experienced with Git um, have kind of the, the easiest method possible. It's probably more a religious thing than a conceptual thing, honestly speaking. <laughs> there, there may be some dogma in it as well. Uh, there's a, yeah, that, as for anything that's this ubiquitous in the software community, there are bound to be very strong opinions in multiple directions. Okay, uh, I don't hear any follow-up questions or comments on that particular subject. Uh, so I can, I, I think I'll move on to the, the other thing that I sort of cut out from my morning's presentation um, that may be of interest to people. Um, 
So I said, uh, I said a lot and I presented a lot of slides on changing the UFS weather model, which is definitely the, in the same framework, it's definitely the easiest uh, bit of code to be changing uh, for the UFS uh, medium range weather model. Um, but it's not where everything happens. Um, there's uh, There were already questions uh, last week um, during the, uh, during the practice sessions, I think about uh, about post UPP um, and how you would modify uh, how you'd go about modifying that, or maybe that was during one of the talks. Um, but because it basically because of the way that uh, that change res cube and NSEP post are handled, um, only the UFS weather model is actually uh, is actually provided uh, compiled from source through the UFS senior weather app. Um, and when I say the UFS weather model, I mean all the code underneath that, all the submodules, everything that branches off from there. Um, and in addition, I think there's a there's a couple of interface codes as well. But change res cube, um, sort of the the initial initialization program, and nset post, the post processing, um, they're they're somewhat more complicated. Um, they are provided in nset libs rather than as individual components within uh, within seam that are compiled through the seam framework. And so code changes are obviously more complicated when you get into that. So um, in order to change one of those pieces of code, you have to build your own version of NSEP libs rather than using a pre-installed version. Um, for some of you, uh, depending on what platform you're running on, if you're on Cheyenne or a NOAA machine, um, you will more than likely have access to the NSEP libs that's built already on the machine. Um, some of you working on your own clusters or uh, some other university machine, um, the, uh, you will have to build your own uh, NSEP libs anyway. Um, so this process won't be, um, won't be new in that case, but uh, it, it definitely needs to be done. So you will need to essentially build your own version of NSEP libs. Um, and I put a, a link here that, uh, that will link to um, the documentation in NSEP libs external, and that goes over um, the instructions on how to build NSEP libs external in addition to NSEP libs. And just as a recap for people, I, I think this was on Thursday morning, so people may already forget. So NSEP libs is the set of libraries that's included uh, from NSEP, the National Centers for Environmental Prediction, um, that have traditionally been used in, in numerical weather prediction, whether that be IO, um, interprocessor communications, uh, reading different formats, um, things like that. Um, however, these now those libraries, they're very static, they're very robust, it's very unlikely that you'll have to change them. However, because uh, change res cube and post are both provided within the NSEP libs framework for the medium range weather app, um, you will need to kind of delve into the building and, and uh, how NSEP libs gets billed in order to modify those codes. Um, so that's all a very wordy way of saying. So the NSEP libs external package um, will likely not need to be rebuilt. If you used that, the NSEP libs external is basically all the prerequisites for the NSEP libs libraries. Um, and if you've already built that, which uh, presumably you will, you will have, um, although it is possible to get by without that, um, you do not need to rebuild that. Um, however, you will have to specify where those libraries are located uh, when you go to install NSEP libs in the directory of your choosing. Um, so before building a new copy of NSEP libs, um, assuming you've made these modifications to uh, either post or change res, um, you will need to point to the location of the branch where you've made those modifications. Um, so the, the release slash public v1 branch uh, of NSEP libs, which is the one that is that does correspond with the medium range weather app release, um, it uses git submodules directly rather than manage externals. And I know I went over manage externals in my talk earlier. I briefly mentioned submodules, but not really. Um, so I need to uh, go over that a little bit more. So in order to reinstall NSEP libs, in order to uh, rebuild this post code, um, what you'll need to do is uh, kind of clone the NSEP libs as normal. Um, whereas previously we included a flag that said recursive, um, we're not going to include that here because what the recursive uh, flag does is when you clone, you also clone all the submodules. And because we actually want to go into the repository and edit the submodules before we do this, before we go and get them, 
we don't want to do that off the bat. So we uh, we do the git clone step. Uh, we check out the develop branch, although um, in this case, it, it will depend, but you'll likely want to, if you're doing development, you will almost certainly want to use the develop branch rather than the release, uh, one of the release branches. Um, and you can clone it from there. And here I just uh, cloned it into a directory known as custom nzeplos build. Um, although then I didn't update this next line. So this next line should actually say uh, change directory into custom nzeplos build instead of nzeplos. Um, so once you're in the nzeplos, um, you will need to edit a file that's called .git, modu .git modules. Um, and that will look something like the top right there. Um, so it'll have a bunch of sections, one for each sub module, which again, they are self-contained repositories. Um, and you'll scroll all the way, almost all the way to the bottom, I believe. And then there's a couple that are listed there that one of which is nceplibs post and one of which is UFS utils. And UFS utils is where the change res cube uh, utility comes from. Um, so then instead of having the no MC slash EMC post, say you're you're making modifications there, you would point to your fork and to the specific branch where you've made your modifications to NSEP libs post. And finally, uh, once you're happy that that's pointing to the correct direction and you're ready to start building, um, you would issue the command git submodule update and then a, a few flags, dash dash init, dash dash recursive. And that basically just gets all of the submodules underneath NSEP libs that we did not get during the clone step. And it will also pull the fork and branch of the, uh, in this case, EMC post that, you spe that I specified in this example. Um, and you'll see a whole bunch of text flyby um, related to submodules and things like that. But I basically highlighted the important part, which shows that once I edited this uh, to say, well, instead of saying, Noah EMC, I edited it to say mkvulich, which is my fork. Um, and now it's getting code from that fork instead of from the main authoritative repository. And it's getting it from the branch that I specified. Um, and once that's done, you can follow the instructions in the link I provided on the, on the previous slide to complete the build of NSEP libs. And finally, when you go to uh, build and run uh, the, Mr. the medium range weather app through the SEAM framework, um, you would have to set the uh, environment variable ncep libster um, in order to point to that proper location of the ncep libraries so that seam can then get that and build all the code properly. Okay, so again, I've, uh, I've, I've talked for a while and I know all this, uh, this command line stuff can be very hard to follow along with and, and esoteric if you're not uh, actually doing it. But um, as we've mentioned, I, I hope that uh, that you'll take advantage of the fact that we will be uploading these presentations. Um, those slides will be included in my uh, presentation from this morning um, so that people will be able to uh, follow along and, and kind of revisit this subject later um, and have this documentation available. Just a note, Mike, I, I already uploaded those so um, over lunch, so we should be good to go. If people Excellent. need access to them, they're, on, they're linked to the agenda. Excellent, thanks, Jamie. Okay, did anyone have any? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, just a quick question uh, on those ones that she uploaded. Um, with those extra slides you just added, uh, will you make sure that you've corrected that one small error you had on which directory you're going to? Ah, uh, yes, I, I can do that. Great, um, yeah, that'll be helpful. Jamie, I suppose I'll go in and uh, upload a new version um, and I can, I can send you a message when it's ready to pull. Sure, no problem, thanks. Okay, so it's Monday afternoon. Everybody's everybody's tired and overwhelmed. Um, were there any other uh, other questions that were people were holding on to? Otherwise, I can I can delve into the the list of questions that I've uh, 
I've been saving for this occasion. Okay. We can, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, copy some of these into Slack. So there's also a um, permanent record of it for, of sorts. Um, so one of the, uh, one of the suggested questions, and uh, I guess this is kind of a, a, a personal opinion sort of thing. So we, we had mentioned uh, the potential for uh, getting data for, for doing research. Um, one thing that, that I didn't think got brought up was, um, uh, was more recent uh, and faster ways of getting data. So um, does anyone know if there are yeah, ways? Does, any, data, huh? uh, does anyone know if there are uh, ways to get uh, kind of re near real time data? Um, as far as initi initiating the global model? Because I know that's kind of a frequent question. I used to work on the WERF help desk and that was always a frequent question that people had when trying to set up their own systems. Um, hi, Mike, this is Ligia. So yes, there is a way to get near real time data to, to use for raw initial conditions for the app. And that is described uh, in the user's guide uh, there is actually a whole subsection about that topic. Uh, so there is a, a NOAA uh, website where people can find uh, GRIB2 archives. Uh, so that's like near real time and past dates for GRIB2. Uh, and uh, if people are really focus just on real time, then you can find an MSIO uh, raw initial conditions for the last 10 days. I mean, that would be at the preferable use because NEMS.io has, those files contain more data. You know, they have a more resolution than the GRIB2. So I would say if you're looking for the last 10 days, NEMS.io is great. If you're looking for other archives, then go for GRIB2. Great, Leisha, thanks. Um, if, you, if you have that accessible, I, I thought I had, uh, the window open, but I don't. But uh, if you could reply to my question in Slack, I'd appreciate um, if you could uh, link to that section in the user's guide. Uh, yeah, sure, I can do that. Thanks. And this is Sharon. Even if things are in your user guide, it wouldn't hurt to repeat them in a frequently asked question because a lot of people don't have the discipline to read every line of a user guide and then they get impatient and want to look for an FAQ. <laughs> yeah, that's that's why I'm, uh, yeah, I'm definitely not afraid. I, I am I am personally not a, an expert on most parts of the uh, medium range weather app. Um, most of the stuff I've, I've been working on is related to code management and, post, and the UPP system. Um, and so I'm not afraid to, to ask the uh, potentially dumb questions. Um, hopefully uh, none of the, the students here are afraid to ask, uh, ask those kinds of questions as well, because as you mentioned, um, not everyone has had a chance to read the user's guide. Um, not everybody remembers everything that's in the user's guide. Um, and there, there's a lot of documentation out there, which is a good thing, but that also means that it may be hard to find exactly what you're looking for. Okay, so if there are no other uh, questions hanging out out there, I can move on to the, to the next suggested question I have. Um, and that is related to a potentially sticky topic because this is, not a, this is not actually supported in the medium range weather app, but um, I'm curious about, uh, I, I know it is planned to, to be touched on in the future and that is, that is related to nesting. Um, so is, what kind of uh, effort would it take to actually do nesting? 
I guess is my question. Um, is this something that is going to require, is not even worth looking into for the individual user and is going to require a, uh, a sort of team, large team effort? Or is it something that people that is unsupported, but sort of exists and people may be able to get results from it? And it may be that nobody in this room actually even knows. <laughs> It's a very good question. I wonder if the silence is now meaning that nobody in this room knows. This is Sharon. I know EMC was running a nest parallel to their limited area model, and those results are out on the web page. So, I mean, you can do one nest, I think, in the global tile, but I have no idea what the future of that nesting option is. You need a GFDL to chime in, too, maybe. I don't know if any of the shield versions have nests. I didn't. I don't remember from the talk. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I actually meant to go back and review that talk, but I but I didn't have time. Um, yeah, the the shield framework seemed like it had a few different uh, uh, configurations that uh, maybe similar to that. Um, but I yeah I I would have to uh, check on that presentation because I, I that's another part of the uh, the UFS related system that I'm I'm definitely not an expert on. But but EMC definitely decided to go a little limited area model instead of running the nest in the global. So some there must be a reason they went that path. And I, I don't know what it is, but I would think there's a either computational reason or a scientific reason or they want to isolate the scope of what each model is responsible for. Something like that. I do know there is a reason, but I'm I'm curious if someone closer to the subject will will pipe up to to talk about it. So it's it's turn. copy. Sorry, go ahead, Lisa. Okay, well, I'm showing we can have different perspectives. Um, so I I think we would like to have uh, you know runs that are high resolution, and it is very hard to do high resolution over the entire globe. Then we're left with options such as using a stretch grid or a global plus nest or uh, a regional domain. And uh, those, all of those are possible solutions. Of course, global, you know, high resolution will be very, very expensive um, with, and the limited area model would be the least expensive of all those options. And uh, in, in the last uh, couple of years, the folks that work in the hurricane application of the UFS, uh, so that's the group that, you know, usually does the, the HWARF and HMON, and it's now switching for the hurricane application of the UFS. They ran several tests, including real-time tests in the, I don't know if this hurricane season, but definitely the previous one, where they ran like a global plus nest and just a limited area domain, and that was over the Atlantic basin. Uh, so the, the limited area was three kilometers or a global plus a nest that was also three kilometers. And when they compare those results of both those three kilometers, uh, the, the regional did very well. It didn't, you know, it did not degrade the results by not having that associated global model and just using like lateral boundary conditions. So I think that's one of, one of the reasons why um, there's a push to move forward with the, the regional uh, limited area model. But I, uh, in terms of the code of the, the UFS weather model that's on the VELOP branch, so not part of the public release, but the develop branch, that is configurable uh, with Global Plus Nest. And is there any documentation in the user's guide about that, or would it have to be, uh, um, it would just be uh, unofficial documentation? There is no documentation about that because it's not part of the supported capabilities at this time. Okay. On um, this funny, I want to add one more point of why we need to separate them uh, from EMC. Um, so for the high resolution model, we need to run the data simulation also at higher uh, frequencies, already window. 
the global model you already run in six hour window. If you use the next option, uh, it's going to be difficult to, to, to run early data screening window because they don't have a observation everywhere. Also, it's very, very expensive. So it's, it's also a separate concern. So um, that's why we decided to go to the um, regional model, like the one tile regional model instead of using the nest. Perhaps. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, I didn't see if that if I cut somebody off. Um, the uh, oh, thanks everybody for for the input on that. So yeah, it seems like the 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 app in the in the future is going to go ahead at, without officially supporting the nesting capability at least in the near future. Um, and I suppose the uh, as Lijia was mentioning the uh, the results there was no degradation of results with just using the standalone regional model or regional uh, uh, configuration uh, versus the nesting and I guess uh, that probably speaks to one of the huge advantages of kind of unifying around a single dynamical core. Um, you kind of have a have an advantage over previous uh, iterations of these configurations where we would have a wharf based uh, hurricane or regional model um, that is taking initial conditions from the GFS spectral model, which may have some some interpolation difficulties. Um, I, just a quick call, follow up uh, for Ligia. Do you anticipate this being a supported feature in the future, or is that not being discussed at this point? I have not been in, in any discussions that involved uh, supporting that capability. Uh, I see. I've been in a lot of discussions regarding supporting coupled capabilities in the future, but I haven't heard so much about nesting. Okay. Thanks. Okay, that seems like a good time to, to move to my next sort of a suggested question for discussion, um, which is that uh, the question sort of pertaining to the, the standalone regional capability. Obviously, this has not been released to the public yet, but we do plan in the next few months. And the question is, uh, will you be able to use output from the global model runs um, to initialize the UFS short range weather app? Um, at least in the released code. I know, I know that uh, capability technically exists, but I'm curious if that's something that will be easy for the user to do, or if it's something that people will have to, uh, have to dig a little harder to do. Yeah, Mike, that should be as easy as changing the external model data that you want to use in your config script um, in the workflow to FV3GFS. You'll have the option to use either GRIB2 or NEMS.IO data. Um, those have been rigorously tested, so it should be fairly easy. Jeff, with the output of the short range weather app, it, it is like Dyn and Fizz files. So do you just specify that you use both of those? Um, maybe I misunderstood the question. Is this, is it, I thought this was related to initializing the model off of these, but you're referring to the output? Well, the output of the, oh yeah, that's from the regional. I'm sorry, I'm confusing myself. No, it's yeah. okay. No, 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 okay. yeah, 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 sorry. Okay. But you mean using the output, like you would run this UFS medium range weather app, including UPP, right? And then use that post-processor output to initialize the regional. Correct, yeah. yes, I, I should have clarified that because obviously the, the UFS uh, medium range weather app is outputting net CDF data. And that is not one of the things that we can use, I believe. I don't believe you can initialize the short range weather app with net CDF data. Um, but so the GRIB2 data, sorry, go ahead, Jeff. We technically can initialize off of net CDF data. It just hasn't been tested. So that support exists in Changeros Cube. It's just not something that we have tested in the regional uh, FV3 lamb. It's been tested in the global and works. We've just never gone to, to the point of testing it in, in the lamb. Um, we've really been focused on grip two functionality recently. 
um, just to make sure we get that implemented correctly. But um, it's possible it would work. Okay, but I, I, I think I assume this won't be documented, um, so it probably won't be an officially supported data type. Not for the first release, no, yeah. Okay, but perhaps in the future going forward. Potentially, yep. Good, that's good to know. Has anybody okay. ever actually tried to do that? Like initialize the short range weather app from the medium range weather app? I, I was just wondering if all the necessary fields uh, that you, I wonder if UPP is outputting all the necessary fields or any change in UPP configuration would be needed. So we've initialized the short range weather app off of FE3 GFS output from earlier in this year. And so I assume that that's coming from the media range weather app from the global workflow. So it-, well, it But the, the global workflow like operational or even like not operational, but run, you know, in research mode may have UPP configured differently than in this app here, this public release. Okay, that I don't know, yeah. Yeah, I think it would be, if the user started changing the UPP configure file, it could get quite tricky. And even with the default, I'm not sure. I don't think anybody's tested that. So I'm not sure that if it would work out of the box or not. It, you'd probably have to, you know, if there are variables that are missing because someone has changed the UPP flat file, then you'd have to go into what we call the var map table which is uh, what change res uses to know what to do if there's a, a variable that's required that doesn't exist. Um, and so the user would then have to determine, they would have to know what's not included. Um, and then they would have to figure out what to do if that case arose. So you would either have to fill the values with zeros or you would have to tell change res cube to fail and uh, alert the user that a certain variable is not available. So that's, that's definitely an advanced case situation. But I think it's maybe easier just add that back to the UPP control file, right? We have practiced how to add a variables, just use that section to add that back to UPP. In, in the medium range weather app, is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah, yeah, if you know which one missing, just go there, session three from this training, add that variables. <laughs> Yeah, it's not that difficult. Yep. And also, yeah, and I, I have a follow-up question. Sorry, uh, when you do release for the me uh, for for the regional uh, app, uh, are you going to think about other initialize the model from other regional models like Rapper, like we are doing now? So that's going to be part of the release. Um, okay. We. We have it working with the rep experimental and the her experimental models. Grip two output is just fine. We're still troubleshooting operational rep and her data um, because the grip two files are unfortunately different enough that it's causing some issues. Um, and it also works with the NAM uh, grip two files. So we have NAM rep and her sport in the short range weather app. And uh, I know Larissa had written up code for change risk cube to read in uh, UK met data, regional UK met data. Um, so that is not going to be in the release, but it certainly could be something we can provide in the future. It'd be good to get ECMWF support in there too. Okay, so yeah, regional has much more variety of the input options. <laughs> right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that would be especially good to have because now uh, ECMWF has started distributing data more freely. Exactly. Yep. I saw that too. Although I haven't looked into if it's enough to use to initialize a model in real time or not. I'm curious, you mentioned UK met data. What, what format is that typically in? I, I'd have to ask Larissa. My guess is it's net CDF. Okay. Yeah, it's just curious. Yeah, I mean, you, you'd be surprised at how little you need to initialize the FE3. The, the FE3 GFS grip two files, I think you only need like four or five tracers to actually initialize the run. So um, hopefully we could do it on ECMWF data. Cool, thanks everybody for the input. Um, just backing up a little bit, we had talked about uh, 
potentially having the need, if we were going to use GRIB2 data from UPP, um, from the UFS, uh, the medium range weather app, um, that, that should be just as simple as, uh, as modifying the uh, postx config file. Um, I believe that's the case. Um, I wonder if, um, I haven't actually tried that myself, but I, I do know that it should be possible. Um, Tracy, I guess I'll put you on the spot. Do you remember if it was possible to simply um, put a put that po that modified postx config file in the source mods directory, like through the seam framework? Sorry, can you repeat that? So putting the yeah, sorry, config, copying that straight to the source mods UFS ATM directory. Yes. Uh, what was the question behind that? Oh, sorry. I was I was just making sure that if you wanted to make modifications so that you had different output in the in the UPP output, um, it it theoretically should just be as simple as as moving that to the sorts mods directory and and modifying the file there uh, before you do the case build uh, step or sorry the case case run step. Sorry, I forgot. You you would modify your file before you move it over. It's easier to do uh, the modifications in the uh, UPP uh, Parm directory because it has all of the Perl scripts and such in that directory that you need to run to create the new flat file. So you would create the new flat file in in that directory, and then once you have the new flat file um, available, then you move it to that uh, source mods. Uh, directory for UPP to identify, or sorry, for the workflow to identify it. Did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, it's just that simple. I mean, you do have to go through that pre-processing step of creating, modifying, and creating the new flat file is all. Great. Thanks. Okay, while I'm looking for my the correct tab that has the next question, um, I'll just throw out, ask if anybody else has any other questions related to UFS. Um, this is Sharon. Are you, sure. it's, this may have been covered, but I cannot think right now. What code is actually doing the horizontal transformations? Is that in a NSEP library? Is that ECMMF or is that NEMS? Or, or is that just a Fortran and change res utility? So apologies if this was actually <laughs> in a slide and I that's, just didn't pay attention. <laughs> that's quite all right. I, I actually don't know the answer, so I'll I'll open it up to some of the other experts who are sitting in the room here. Are you, are you asking about the interpolation for the external model data to the FE3 yeah, model correct. grid? Yeah, NEMS IO to NetCDF staggered D grid, you know. Yeah, that's that handled it. It's handled uniquely in change res cube. Okay. Okay. So yeah. it's not that it's handing it off to some other. other no, it's other. it. So change res cube is built around ESMF. Right. Right. That's what I'm wondering. Is really what the what change res cube uses to do all of that remapping. It's using a bunch of ESMF modules to do the vertical and horizontal interpolations to the correct grid, the C and D wins. Uh, right. Etc. So yeah, that's that's all taking place in Changers Cube. But but really, the workhorse is ECM. <laughs> yeah, I cannot say my letters right. The Earth System Modeling Framework Library. Yeah, that's is that is the, all the heavy lifting. Absolutely, you're correct. And so yep. when you go when you said you can do net CDF to net CDF, that really means the staggered grid to staggered grid. Is that a direct transformation, or do you have to go to the mass point? Do you know what I'm asking? Oh, uh, that's a. <laughs> That's a good question. I'm just um, curious. I don't need to know, but that's that's. I don't know how ESMF handles that actually, but that whatever ESMF does is what Change Res is going to do. So, um, <laughs> all right, thanks. Yeah, um, if you really want to know the answer to that, we can we can ping George Gano. I have his email too. So <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Um, yeah, th uh, thanks for the question. I'll, I'll say um, definitely don't be afraid. If you think something's been covered uh, in a previous presentation and you just missed it, definitely don't be afraid. This has been three solid days of very heavy and diverse 
uh, talks from experts. I mean, you've seen we, we've had uh, more than a dozen experts from three or four different institutions, all covering parts of the UFS in detail. Um, this is all too much to keep in one person's head. So if you have if you have questions, even if you think that they have been answered already, feel free to feel free to ask them again. Um, okay, uh, I'll move on to uh, something that was. Um, actually kind of a question that I, that I had for my own curiosity. Um, and that's where, um, so UFS uh, medium range weather app is built through the same framework. Um, my question is, and this is especially pro going to be an issue for people who are not building on supported platforms is that um, if something has gone wrong, um, where would they look to find the, the log files and how would they go about debugging if their build fails for some reason. Uh, you know, I, say, I saved this for close to last because I knew uh, Ufuk could not make it until three o'clock. So it looks like he's actually not here yet. So I may, if unless anybody else wants to chime in, I may uh, save that for, for, for a, a bit later. Hey Mike, this is Tom. So, oh, Laurie, go ahead, please. All right. I was just going to say for the build of the um, SIEM weather application, it builds in a subdirectory called BLD under your case directory. And so the log files from that build will go there. Um, I'm not sure exactly what log files you wanted to ask about. There are log files for the running in the run directory. Um, yes. Yeah, so so port SIEM to a new platform, that's kind of a different animal. Yeah, so the uh, the question was basically about the build. So uh, in the build subdirect, mainly because I've 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 built it several times, helping out uh, with the practice exercises here. But I've only been building on say Cheyenne, and everything went very smoothly, and I never nothing ever broke. So I was just curious if something had broke, where would I go to to learn about what had broken and how to sort of debug that. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I think I remember from the previous, uh, from the SIEM talks is that uh, under the hood, it's using CMake. Well, I guess that's based on the UFS weather model, correct? It is based on what the UFS weather model uses. So. Okay. So any, any errors would be sort of in the typical CMake slash GNU make format, um, right. depending on which step had failed. So yes, Mike, in the, in the build directory that in that build directory that Laurie mentioned, there is a ufs.atm.bld.log or whatever it's going to be called. And um, that one contains the error messages. Um, the, way, the way the scene build works, the way the scene build works is um, that it creates a new module file called module, uh, module file slash whatever it is, um, seam slash fv3. And then it uses a an imaginary, imaginary machine seam that it configures as the target platform. So you're not using any, you're not using any of the existing module files. You're using a, a, a new module file that's created based on the seam config in the XML files. So any machine you're building on will be called seam internally when it's building the model. Okay, that's good to know. Um, especially since I have most of my experience building the model on these supported platforms independently. So I guess the build has the, the potential to work in a slightly different way through the SIEM framework. I have a quick question about workflows. Um, so there was a question earlier last week um, about whether there was a plan to merge the different workflows. I mean, we specifically talked about amongst different applications. So the medium range weather application uses a different workflow from the short range weather app and from the halves and so on. But we never really talked about 
um, whether there's been discussion with amongst um, the players of the medium range weather application itself um, to merge both the seam based and the global workflow that are currently being used. So I'm just curious if anybody could talk about that. Hey, Jamie, this is Dom. I think you're opening a can of worms here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so don't don't discuss that. That's fine. I was just no, curious. Go for it. I don't think there is any simple answer because both serve different purposes and work well for the people that are working with them. But mm -hmm. um, it's hard to, to, to see how they convert. Yeah, it's it's most difficult for developers who might fall in the middle um, or, you know, that have learned with the scene, but then as they go to more focused development might not be using the same workflow. So I was just curious. So well, Jamie, okay. I think that there has been a lot of discussion, uh, but I, I wouldn't say there is a, a way forward, you know, a clear way forward yet at this time. Um, I think like Dom was saying, you know, for the public release, it was necessary to have something very portable, friendly, easy to use while you know, what, what we call the global workflow has a lot of capabilities. Of course, it can do, you know, this cycle data simulation, but it can also run like uh, thousands of cases automatically and has a lot of fallbacks, like it's very automated. Mm -hmm. um, and I, in my opinion, it is, it does create a problem for those that want to transition from using the public release to a more, you know, close to R2O or research to operations type of uh, approach. Mm -hmm. So I think that that drawback has been recognized as well as the pros of having, you know, the two workflows. And there, there is lots of discussion, but uh, haven't figured out yet how to converge them. Yeah, maybe maybe uh, Seam will just evolve to have some more advanced features, uh, making a few of these parts a little easier um, to integrate in. But I, thanks, thanks for the comments. Yeah, I think one of the uh, the advantages that the Seam brings uh, will be with the coupled models. You know, because the Seam is widely used for Earth system models like the CESM or the you know, Department of Energy, E3SM. And when it comes to simultaneously configuring uh, the, the sea ice model and the ocean and the land and the lake and the I don't know what, uh, and all of that has to work together. And also when you need to have, you want to have the ability to do hierarchical testing and development by substituting an active model by a data model, like a, a canned, set of data sets that replaces one of these models as a forcing on uh, the seam has a you know as a forte in this area uh, so that's one of the reasons one of the the strengths that the seam uh, brings to the table great thanks i think sharon did you want to say yeah, I, on that? so the, so the only thing i've wondered about with seam is, is, is it able to, which Ricotto can handle, you know, you say, I want to try five times. So, oh, it failed because your machine is flaky. Not really that your model's bad. Um, does seam have that kind of database keeping track of how many times before it gives up, like running a post job or something like that? I, I guess I, I may be uh, incorrect, but it seems as if uh, there's no actual uh, um, Rakoto-like uh, management going on within Seam. I Again, please somebody tell me if I'm incorrect, but it seems like it's more that it will handle the, the creation and the submission of jobs, but does not necessarily track um, whether they've been successful and attempt to say rerun them. But it does have dependency because it did change res and waited on the forecast in the post until the change True. was done. So there's some- uh, But I, I believe that is handled uh, through the functionality of the job queue submission itself. But again, I'm, Got it. I'm only chiming in because <laughs> nobody because nobody else was chiming in. I, I am certainly not an expert. Yeah, Rakoto just uses a cron job that's constantly checking 
a database to decide what to do next. It's that simple. Yeah, I would be curious to learn the specifics of how that work, but works. But I believe, again, without being an expert, that uh, it, it kind of relies on there being a, a job queue submission um, that that includes those dependencies. So it will wait for the first job to complete before the, the second job starts. Yeah, I, b I believe you're right, Mike, that, uh, you know, the, the way a uh, seam is used in this app does not have like a, a full workflow management system such as Rokoto. But uh, in other uses of seam, not for this app, uh, it can interface with Silk. Silk uh, spelled uh, C-Y-L-C. Uh, it is another workflow management system similar to Rokoto. So, um, Seam does have this capability, which could be a leverage for future releases. And UK Met Office uses Silk, I believe, right? Yeah, that's right. All right, thanks again for the, for the feedback and input there. And um, the, uh, so this wasn't originally a question I had, but since uh, Lisa had brought up the model coupling and things like that, um, I am I know it's many many months away uh, for the the next uh, global release, but I'm curious if there's kind of an idea of what features might be included in the next, like a, a sneak peek, if you will, of the of the uh, medium range weather app version 2.0 or what, whichever number we settle on. Um, like, for example, ocean modeling, would that would that be something that's potentially included? So, um, Mike, a lot of the planning for the, the upcoming releases is a little bit on the air as this new center called Epic gets to up. I don't know if that was that came up during this training at all, if people are familiar with it. Uh, but it is a new center to be funded by NOAA to have a strong role in code management and public releases and user support of the UFS. But uh, Epic does not exist yet. I mean, the, the funding has been secured and there is now a process to uh, figure out who is going to, to run this center. But one of their uh, responsibilities will be public releases. And because we are in this transition period from some responsibilities that are currently held by the DTC along with many partners, to be transitioned to Epic, I would say that this the plan is it's murky. It's less clear at the moment. So I think it is safe to say that there will be future releases of the medium range weather app and that there will be a strong push for them to be in the coupled system and that at some point they should also include data simulation. But you know, in terms of the timeline or the next steps, uh, they I am not very clear. Maybe others uh, here can can speak about it. Yes. Well, I, I think you've actually summed up pretty much everything we know about Epic at this point. Because um, as you mentioned, the the funding has been secured, but the the contract has not been awarded. So it's not even clear which institution. Uh, will be, or or even a new institution will be uh, handling the, the the creation and and functionalities of Epic. Um, so yeah, thanks for bringing up Epic. I I uh, I don't think it has been uh, mentioned, um, but that is hopefully a uh, an acronym and a, a term that people will be use will be hearing a lot um, because they are supposed to sort of centralize a lot of the uh, the support. And um, and documentation and other public facing uh, parts of the UFS um, that will hopefully uh, lead to a, a much more uh, robust uh, system. Not not that we've done a done a terrible job. I think the there's a lot of people who who did a great job getting this uh, release together. But uh, I also know there's many people who are who are happy to hand off some of the responsibilities to a, to a new public release uh, center. 
Um, so uh, somebody remind me what EPIC stands for. Uh, I cannot remember. Earth Prediction and Innovation Center. Yes, Earth, Earth Prediction and Innovation Center. So uh, again, hopefully they, they will be a, a name that, that most of you will become very familiar with in the coming years. Okay, what was the last question? Um, okay, so that, yeah, this was a, a question. Actually, actually, Dom already sort of answered this um, related to my debugging the build problems question. Um, but yeah, uh, when you're uh, going through runtime, um, and, uh, and you have a runtime failure, uh, that's, I guess, another question um, as how you, how you would debug that. So there's, a, there's obviously log files for each, the, the change res, the atmospheric model, and the, and the post-processing. Um, I'm curious if there's, if there's anything else that, uh, that somebody would want to mention related to kind of discovering and, and working around problems that you may have at runtime in the, in the SIEM framework. Mike, this is Lori. I would add that the um, preview run and preview name list utilities provided by Theme, which we use throughout the practical session, are very handy for debugging if your job just isn't working like you think it should. So it's it's more of a, a wrapper diagnostic rather than a model or a pre-processing. So remember preview run and preview. Great point, Lori. Thanks for uh, reiterating that. Okay, so it's uh, it's about ten minutes after three. Um, we have about twenty minutes left uh, in our in our allocated time. Um, oh, perfect! I, I see a question has come up. Um, so the the question is, what is the nature of the input file for UFS, and can we use the UFS to predict real time weather conditions? Um, let me uh, copy that down into Slack just so we have a, a permanent record of it. Um, and I guess the the, uh, the first question about the input file, um, I know that uh, the UFS can can handle the uh, the it's both the NEMS IO and GFS or sorry GRIB two inputs. That's correct, right? Uh, yes, so that's at correct. this at yeah, sorry, at this time we only support input from the GFS, so you cannot start from, say, ECMWF or summary analysis. We're only supporting the GFS, and the uh, formats are NetCDF, NEMS-IO, and GRIP2. OK, and I guess to, to piggyback on top of the first part of that question, um, I'm actually not familiar with the uh, with the output that comes from ChangeRes Cube, um, does that come out in that CDF format, like the actual files that are read by the model itself? Yeah, Mike, those are there are two two net CDFs for initialization time, uh, one for the surface data, another for the atmospheric data, and then for every boundary uh, boundary condition uh, update interval, there's a GFS data uh, LBC file in that CDF format. Okay, great. And uh, I, I can't remember if we if we touched on this in the practice sessions, but there are a lot of tools out there for kind of interrogating net CDF data, um, and that's including command line tools such as NC Dump and uh, also visualization such as NC View. Um, so there, there, net CDF is a is a it's a self descriptive data format, so it's very convenient and it's it's 
used throughout kind of the atmospheric and geoscience community. Um, I can't, I, I thought I heard, maybe I, I interrupted somebody. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, I can go explain ahead. Little, uh, little more the difference. Uh, so what's coming out of the changes we call the, the so-called cold start ideal conditions. Um, what the model writes out, the format, uh, they are still in data set for, but the, the file format, the, the file names, the number of files are different from this code start ideal condition. So you, if you use uh, what the model writes out uh, and you restart the model, you should be able to reproduce the forecast. But using the code start, you cannot. Okay, so you're you're actually talking about in a in a cycling context. Um, so it's not really cycling. Even you say you run the model for say twenty four hours, uh, you stop. The model will write out the so called uh, restart files. Those files are different from what you get by running the change rates. I think what what Feng Ling is saying does relate to to cycling. Feng Ling, see if I if I get this right. Um, if someone were to go to the to the to the archives and get the NEMS IO files that we are saying they should use as raw initial conditions for this app, and they start a forecast from that, they will get a result that is different from what the GFS model, the operational model itself would get uh, because the GFS model doesn't start from those same files. It starts from this so-called warm restart files, which are kind of a, a restart file that's a product of the data simulation. I don't know if I- uh, that's, that. case, uh, uh, that's so related, you're right. But in another sense, say you want to run a, a climate run for 100 years. You have limited CPU for each time you submit the job. You have to stop and then restart the model. That's another scenario. So you need the ideal condition. So you run every time, say five years, you stop the model. You will have the uh, ideal condition saved for restart another five year patch. Uh, so that ideal condition will be different from what you get from the very beginning and running from the change rates. Okay, but um, all right, but on a related topic here. So the, the question was, you know, can this, can the, the UFS or can this app be used to predict real time weather? And I would say the answer is yes. Uh, the results may not be identical to, to what the GFS, they will not be identical to what the GFS will make. But, um, you know, they can certainly predict weather. Now the, the SIEM workflow as is will not automate a real-time run. So any kind of automation process will fall on the, the user's responsibility. Okay, uh, there's a, another question in the chat um, that I'm uh, frantically trying to, to type. Um, so are there any current scientific publications uh, that make use of the UFS for weather, predic weather prediction uh, particularly? Um, sorry, uh, weather prediction of a particular place. Um, so I suppose the, uh, I, I don't know if there have been any um, I know there have been studies published about the uh, um, the system uh, various in various configurations, but yeah, I, I am curious if the release code has been used. If anybody if anybody knows about that.
uh, Mike, I, I'm not aware of that. It might be a little bit too early, you know, because it was released first time in March and we're only in November. So publication, you know, does take longer than that. Um, in, the, in the UFS workshop, which happened, I guess I forgot when, like August, I think it was, uh, there were a lot of conference presentations that used the UFS. So that's a good resource. Um, seems like there was a list of papers somewhere I'm trying to dig out, but they weren't about this specific app, but they were, they use pieces of the UFS. For example, there are publications that use stochastic physics. Um, so there are, you know, the, and there is publications about the FE3 dynamical core. So there is component publications. Thanks, Leisha. And uh, thanks, uh, Jamie, for posting that link. That's what I was actually just looking for. Um, so yeah, uh, in the, like I mentioned, I've been uh, taking all these questions and putting them in the, in the presentations room uh, on the Slack channel, um, just so all this can be, can kind of have a permanent text record in addition to the, the recording that will go up later. Um, Jamie uh, posted a link to the UFS workshop agenda, and that does have links to, um, I believe, every single one of the uh, presentations, maybe a few missing, but um, there were many, at least preliminary scientific results that were uh, sort of discussed there. Um, so that's definitely a great resource to check out um, for sort of the most late breaking uh, uh, developments from the, from the UFS. Just to follow up briefly, um, I, Jeff, I don't know if you know, do you, is the UFS Users Workshop going to be a, an annual event? I mean, now That's, we have new users. So if you're interested yeah. and want to do some research, um, keep your eyes out for next, next summer, potentially. Yes, that's the plan. Um, I'm uh, pretty sure it was in July this year. Uh, and then there are already plans to um, have a second users workshop uh, next, uh, next year, next summer. So yeah, please look out for that and for the opportunity to sign up, participate. If you've done any work with the, the code, feel free to uh, send in an abstract. Um, that brings up a question that, uh, that, that I hadn't thought of before, but uh, there, um, there currently isn't um, one particular mailing list for these kind of announcements, is there? Like say related to a new UFS workshop or UFS training or things like that. That's all coming through the UFS forums page. Uh, so there's announce there is an announcements forum that those are posted to. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, that's that's a good point. So that's uh, that's where people would want to go to kind of keep on keep on track with the latest uh, community uh, training or releases or uh, conferences and workshops. Um, that's sort of being handled through the through the UFS forum. Um, I suppose I should throw that link up on the on the Slack because we've we've put it in a few places, but um, we definitely want to uh, to sort of uh, consolidate the, the community around these forums, um, especially once we leave today and, uh, and people may start working on their own scientific uh, uh, developments and, and use the system and uh, fiddle with the system. Um, we hope that we can uh, get a lot of you not only asking questions, but also answering questions that you see in the, in the UFS forum. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll post that in the, in the Slack as well, but that, uh, hopefully is something that uh, uh, all of you will will visit fairly frequently as you're going through your adventures in UFS land. Okay, we're coming up on, on 10 minutes left uh, in our allotted time here. Um, 
I guess one thing I, I, uh, I definitely uh, keep asking questions if you, if you have them. Um, I'll certainly be paying attention to Slack for the rest of the day just to make sure everybody can at least get a, an answer to their questions if they, if they think of them later. Um, I was curious if, uh, if any of the, uh, any of the presenters or uh, the fellow organizers, uh, Jamie and Ming, had any kind of final remarks that they, that they might want to uh, bring up. Uh, I, I'd just like to thank everybody for being a part of the first UFS medium range weather application training. Um, I see Lee's question here about what type of feedback we're hoping uh, for in the Slack channel. Um, what we're really looking for is any, any type of feedback you have on something that maybe we have missed that we didn't cover that you felt like would have been really useful. Um, if there's anything that you felt like didn't work very well, um, there may be a different venue for how to um, provide this information, especially in this virtual format. Um, who knows where we'll be at next year. So um, any, any type of feedback on that. Or if you have any feedback on things that you really liked, um, you thought that that part, like maybe Slack, you really liked the Slack channel aspect. Um, any of those kinds of things would be greatly appreciated in the feedback channel. Uh, the agenda will ultimately be opened up now that we are through the training sessions. Um, we will take off that password protected site and just have it open so anybody can see the presentations, um, the recordings. So any of that will be accessible. So please feel free to come back and check that out as you go forward. Um, we will continue to monitor this Slack channel um, maybe for a week or two if anything comes up in the near term. Um, for any of the participants. So again, feel free to contact us that way as well. Um, I think that's all I have. Ming, did you have anything else you'd like to add? I don't actually. Thank you everyone. Present, participate. Uh, I learned a lot. I'm really enjoying this training and uh, thank you very much. And uh, I will looking forward to maybe reading these slides in the rest of my life, maybe. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, huge thank you to the presenters, the instructors, the subject matter experts mm -hmm. that um, were involved in this. Certainly could not have done that without you. Um, the way that you convey the information is really important to reach the users in a meaningful way. So thank you. Hey, Jamie, this is Dom. So I think it's time to thank you and Mike and Ming as well for all the hard work and these many, many hours that you have put into this much more than any of us presenters. So thanks a lot for that and looking forward to working on the next tutorial with you and the others. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, we should also thank Brad and uh, for, for running this behind of the thing so smoothly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, for yeah. many of us, I, I know this, me personally, I have only ever used Zoom as a passive listener before. So uh, yeah, Brett, our, uh, our tech representative who's, who's kind of walked us through all the, the difficult steps and taking care of setting up the Zoom meetings and recordings. Um, yeah, thank, great thanks to them. Yes, thank you. Yeah, sure, everyone, happy to help. Happy to help. <laughs> yeah, and they're they're not on the call, but I'll I'll throw out a thank to a thanks to Cecil as well. Um, the uh, for Mick and uh, David, um, and uh, oh, one more person. Uh, I'll thank them. I'll thank them over email. But yeah, setting up everybody's user accounts, uh, uh, yeah. not not being able to deal with people in person. Um, they they. We're definitely very quick to respond to a lot of frantic emails. So I, I send a lot of thanks to Cecil and the, the computing folks. All right, any last minute questions or comments from anybody? Um, this is Fang Yian from EMC and I say a couple of words. First, I really thank this uh, the three folks work on this training session and there's not work involved. Um, thank you for putting this together. 
Uh, GMC probably will be the beneficiary of this kind of Sony in the f- future, uh, if not immediately. Uh, we have been talking about community modeling. We need to uh, get more scientists outside of EMC, also young scientists uh, interested in our model. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, uh, in the future, once you get to know the model and you ask and uh, present new solutions for us to improve our model. Mm-hmm. Also serve, serve the purpose for community research as well. And thank you everyone, especially the organizer community and also all the participants. Yeah, thank you, Penguin. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And and I'll second a thanks to the uh, to the participants as well. Um, it's certainly not easy being sort of the the first round of people into a new modeling system, um, kind of without the, uh, the the peer pressure and the the peer help from from others who may be working on the system already. So we hope that you'll uh, you'll continue to use the system and continue to interact in the forum and uh, and start a uh, making your own contributions and uh, interacting with us as well and giving us feedback, not only on the training, but also on, on how, uh, how the release process has gone and uh, things, that, things that we can improve and, and things that you may wanna help us with and, or have us help you with because uh, the, the whole point of the, the UFS is to have a community that, that feeds off the work of developers who feeds off the work of the community and vice versa ad infinitum as an infinite cycle. So um, so we're, we're really glad to have as much community interaction as we can. All right. All right, well, with that, I think we can probably close this session. Again, feel free to continue to reach out to any of us if, if you need uh, further help in the future. Um, but thank you so much and we'll be seeing you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jamie. It's good to see all the snow behind you. Yes. (laughs) Excellent.